Okay, um, I think we're good to go. Um, I, I, again, we don't need an introduction. So for everybody uh, listening, uh, this is third round. Um, we are hoping to uh, spend this round some more on criticism and uh, critiques. Uh, so we're going to prioritize those questions. Um, I think we should start with a simple one. And it's it's a question by, um, it's from Ben Escadis from the Metacastra forum. I, I, I went there to find, try to find some good um, criticisms. And there are some, there are some criticisms, but they're, fairly large so um, I try to find a couple and at least try to plug the gist from the queries so here's a simple one so let's start with that one um, he asks why is analytic idealism not a version of solipsism I think it's a good question uh, I I often have a, a discussion like this with a personal friend um, Analytic idealism is solipsism at the cosmic level. So you could see it that way. There is only one mind, it's all that exists. So it is a form of solipsism, but it defeats the entire spirit of the word uh, solipsism uh, during the course of Western philosophy, because the idea of solipsism is not that the only mind is the cosmic mind, the spirit of solipsism is that the only mind is your little individual personal mind. Um, and that everybody else are just figures conjured up by your mind. There is nothing it, it is like to be other people. They only exist in so far as what you perceive of them. There's nothing behind the appearance. It's pure appearance. And of course, analytic idealism denies that. It, it grants that everybody has a conscious inner life behind the appearances. In other words, behind, somewhere, somewhere behind their bodies. Uh, um, and it is that conscious inner life that projects the appearance, projects the body, and the conscious inner life of the cosmic mind that projects the physical universe. So analytic idealism, if you just ask me on this spot, is it solipsism? I would say absolutely not, because it contradicts the spirit of solipsism. But if you want to go down, you know, the, the concept and make it more general and say, well, solipsism is much more generic. It's not the notion that there is only my individual mind. It's, no, it's the notion that there is only one mind, even if it's not only my mind. Well, in that case, if you redefine the word that way, then yes, analytic idealism is a form of cosmic solipsism. Uh, but to say that would be to invite misinterpretation. I can't hear you anymore, Jack. Thanks. I was almost forgot how it works. So, so cosmic solipsism. Did you just make that up, or is that an existing term? Uh, no, no. I just made it up. <laughs> made it up. I think it's. Yeah, I think it fits nice. That is a good distinction between uh, what people usually mean when they say solipsism. It's like only my mind exists, but the cosmic solipsism makes a distinction that only mind exists, and you are not. Well, you are that mind, but that like mind you would is say, not restricted to your conscious mental inner life. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So that's a warm up. Um, Raman, do you have a simple question to start with? Uh, sure. I have a question from uh, Slinky Stretchy, uh, and that is: um, Is it important for you to appear on shows with larger audiences? Uh, are there any updates on your planned appearances with Lex Fridman or Joe Rogan? If you have any planned appearances with them. I will contradict myself on this one. Yes, it is important for me to reach as broad uh, an audience as possible. That, that, that's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do. Um, and yes, I've been invited by Lex Friedman and Joe Rogan. Both require me to travel. Um, and I haven't gone there yet. The invitation is pending since February. Um, and in the early days, it was you know, because of COVID. It was still going around. I didn't want to travel. And now our airport here in the Netherlands, uh, Schiphol Airport, is a catastrophe, is complete chaos. Uh, there are lines of six hours to go through security because suddenly everybody wants to travel at the same time. They got bottled up for two years with the, the lockdowns. Everybody wants to travel. And it's just inviting problem. 
to, a problem to go on a trip. I also am um, philosophically even inclined against air travel unless actually necessary because it's a highly polluting thing. Um, and I think we as a civilization would travel, travel much more than necessary. We've come to disregard not only the possibilities of technology like this, what we are doing now, I'm doing it from my home and it's perfectly viable, um, but also the value of our local environment. Uh, the idea that we could spend our holidays, that, that Dutch people could spend their holidays in the Netherlands somehow has become associated with something old fashioned and retro and, and, and not cool. And, and that's ridiculous uh, because there are wonderful places uh, in this country. I've just been to Tessel, a place I go every year, if some, sometimes twice a year, except during the lockdown. Uh, so I'm sort of, uh, in terms of values, I, I, I prefer not to travel. And so I'm giving you a number of excuses why I didn't go <laughs> to Austin, Texas yet. Um, I, I, I probably will. I don't know. There is something in me that is not lighting up the fire to do that and, and i don't know what it is uh, i just gave you a bunch of excuses but I, i'm completely aware that uh, i don't really know the reason why i haven't done uh, that yet I, i'll say something else i am very keenly aware that um, the notion of success during a philosopher's life is incredibly misleading um, if anything, there is an opposite correlation, an inverse correlation between success or, or becoming known during your lifetime and actually making a dent in philosophy, actually being an important, uh, ha having an important contribution to philosophical discourse. And the most obvious example is Nietzsche, who claimed to know the name and surname of every person who bought one of his books during his life. So few were sold, so very few, less than 200 books. Um, he was completely disregarded, unknown, um, neglected um, during his lifetime. And today he's arguably the most influential philosopher of all times, more influential than Plato. Um, and he, he, there are so many examples of this. So I am very keenly aware that um, the visibility I get during my lifetime means very little. Uh, when it comes to the true contribution one makes uh, to philosophy. And this may be playing a role in my lack of enthusiasm to participate in big things. I mean, we just mentioned Lex Friedman and Joe Rogan. There, there are other big things that um, I, I don't fancy. I mean, I just turned down uh, participation in a German TV show um, because I looked at what the producers had done before and I thought, no, um, this doesn't resonate with me. And, and I feel partly guilty about this because now uh, philosophy is my professional life too. It's not only something I do on the side. Uh, so I, I don't know what's going on in me, in my mind. I don't know why I'm not more motivated to go big. Uh, all I can tell you is that uh, I don't consider going big a decisive thing as far as the impact of my contribution is concerned. I don't think I will know in my lifetime what the impact of my contribution is going to be. No philosopher ever knew in their lifetimes how important or completely unimportant they would be. Now let's take another one, David Strauss, who was one of the most recognizable faces of German philosophy in the mid 19th century. Have you ever heard of David Strauss? David Strauss. No, no, you haven't. And, and, and he sold hundreds of thousands of books, which in the mid 19th century was absolutely remarkable, mind boggling. And, and, and Nietzsche in the same time sold less than 200. And today, today I only need to say his surname and you know who Fritz Nietzsche was. But if I say David Strauss, everybody will, will roll their eyes and they go, who, who the hell is David Strauss? So yeah, it's, it, it's complicated. It's not a linear correlation. That's interesting. Um, I'll take a question from L66K. Uh, they ask, uh, if the only solution to the decombination problem is via time, so that there is only one subjective perspective at any one given moment, 
Where does memory and the rest of the world's information go when it is not being held in the current subject's mind? I, I think uh, distinction between phenomenal consciousness and metaconsciousness? That's one part uh, of the answer. Well, let me first dispute the premise uh, to begin. Um, I don't think the only solution to the decombination problem or the decomposition problem, I prefer decomposition because it doesn't sort of suggest that there has been a combination before. <laughs> um, I don't think the only solution is via time. I think um, we know way too little about the phenomenology of mind. Our culture knows way too little about the phenomenology of mind to decree that um, a misunderstanding of time, uh, correction of that misunderstanding is the only way to make sense of how one mind can seem to be many. Uh, we have very little introspective sophistication in our culture. Um, Indian culture is far, far ahead of us in the sophistication of their introspection. And um, they may have better answers uh, to this question that do not necessarily entail a hyperdimensional model of time. Um, but for the Western mind, and I include myself in that, um, that seems to be currently the most promising avenue. And that's why I, I try to promote the work of uh, Bernard Carr uh, so much, um, not just because he's a friend, but because I think what he's doing um, will be seminal. Um, and, and it is the approach of the Western mind to attack a problem, not through introspection, but through modeling. Um, and that's what Bernard is doing, and there is value in that. Um, so I, I dispute the premise. Uh, the second part of the question, can you, can you repeat? Sorry, I lost the question. Uh, can you repeat it? Yeah. Um, where does memory and the rest of the world oh, yeah. information go? So in your model, where uh, it is time-based, where does memory and the rest of uh, the world's information go when you're uh, the subject? It goes nowhere. It's in mind. Everything is always, ever in mind, like memories that you didn't forget. They are always in your mind, uh, but you are not always explicitly thinking of the memories that you have and didn't forget. Uh, it's a question of the focus of attention and metacognition. Where do you place metacognition? That will be the thing that you explicitly re-experience, but it doesn't mean that you aren't experiencing all of the memories you have and haven't forgotten all the time. Uh, it's just not where your metacognition is. Now, that said, there is a level deeper. The mechanism of forgetting is the same mechanism of dissociation. Dissociation and forgetting are two words for the same thing. It's just that dissociation has a broader uh, application. Uh, but forgetting is an instance of dissociation. When you forget something, you are temporarily dissociated from that mental content you do hold and always hold. And the proof of that is that the proof of that is that later on you remember it. Later on you overcome the dissociation. So there are these two mechanisms to account for the appearance of memories go, coming and going. Uh, one is where is the focus of your metacognition? And two is um, your internal dissociations. This dissociation is a hierarchical process. It's not only like there is only one level of dissociation from the cosmic mind to the human mind and it stops there. It keeps on dissociating within the human mind. And dissociation can be pathological in the sense of rendering us dysfunctional in society. We would call that a dissociative identity disorder. Or it can be trivial, even adaptive and protecting because you don't want to always be explicitly remembering your childhood traumas. You don't want that. So it, it is healthy to dissociate from them, not so completely that your personality will fragment itself, uh, but also not keep on replaying that forever. When you replay that forever, we have a name for it. It's called post-traumatic stress disorder. It's your inability to, dis to dissociate from an experience. So, you know, in, in the field of mind, there is a complex interplay of mul multiple levels of dissociation and multiple shifts of the lens of metacognition. And that's what accounts for the appearance of memories going and then coming back and then going again. But they don't go anywhere. They are always ever in the one, in the only place where they can be, which is in mind, in the universal mind. And it's a question of how dissociated you are from a particular mental content that resides 
forever in that mind. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think they meant something else. So okay. uh, your model of dissociation being like a chess player changing positions. So when you're in a certain p position playing white, where are the mental contents that belong to black? They are in your mind, but not in that in that particular complex of your mind um, that your ego has direct metacognitive access to. Uh, the important thing here is to distinguish between your ego, which is a particular complex, a particular cluster of sensations, emotions, thoughts, and inner narratives, uh, and your mind as, a, as an individual. Your mind as an individual is much, much bigger, more encompassing than the ego, which is that tiny part of the mind that you can metacognitively access in, a, in an associated manner almost at all times. Uh, so when the true you, which is not even a person, uh, changes position uh, in the chess, uh, uh, on the chessboard, what's happening, and, and uh, I'm speaking this in the context of that hypothesis I raised in the essay in question, and the reader is, is uh, referring to a particular speculative essay that I published a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, so in the context of that essay and that speculative possibility, um, I and you, are the same person, uh, but in, a, in, the, in the field of mind, that one subject, that is me and is you, uh, has a cluster of associated content that corresponds to your point of view in the world and is dissociated from everything else. And what we refer to as me is that same subject, but now another complex in that subject's mind with internally associated experiences that correspond to my point of view in the world and which at the same time is dissociated from everything else. And that's why I seem to be me and you seem to be you and we seem to be different subjects. Although what's going on is that there is only one subject. So it's a play of associations and dissociations that are done in just the right way that we feel that, uh, hey, we are different subjects. Does that entail that I'm experiencing everything at once? I just don't know that I'm experiencing everything at once? Not you as an altar, not you as a ego complex within the altar, but you as the subject, in other words, the universal subject, Yes, the universe, universal subject is experiencing right now everything that there is to be experienced, including past, all the past and all the future. Uh, but we are dissociated mental complexes in that one subject. Um, and from the point of view of this dissociated complex uh, with a set of experiences that are tightly knit, knitted together, corresponding to the ego narrative, we, from our dissociated point of view, we think we aren't the rest, just like the different alters of a person with dissociative identity disorder, they don't think they are the other alters. And sometimes they are even aware of the existence of other alters, and they refer to these other alters as other people. And it probably it's the same thing going on right now at a higher hierarchical level. All right. Uh... Uh, I have a I have a question for myself. Um, so I know that parapsychology is not your area, uh, uh, but I've been thinking, <laughs> I've been thinking about the hypothesis you put forward to explain uh, reported cases of past life memories. So, the past life memories are simply um, an, uh, an, a human being picking up on the dispersed uh, mental contents of previous alters in the field of nature. Then why do the mental contents almost always correspond to only one identity? Uh, shouldn't we expect children to have past life memories of multiple people instead of just one person, uh, provided oh. that these mental contents are no longer in a boundary? And so it's just as likely that you pick up on the mental contents of any random person who's ever existed. The literature has plenty of cases in which there are memories from multiple so-called past lives, so multiple people. Um, but uh, uh, to answer your question, I will acknowledge that there are also cases in which a child remembers only one life. Um, 
And then let's dig deeper into those cases. What you often see is that the memories are associated with um, traumatic events leading up to death. Like you remember being a fighter pilot in World War II when your plane was in flames crashing into the ocean. That's what you remember. And then you remember that one life, that one pilot, that one individual. Um, I think what's going on here is something that we all know from experience. Um, what you tend to remember better are experiential complex that carry high emotional charge. In other words, things that mark your life. Uh, you are much more propense to remembering things that happened when you, when the day you lost a parent um, or the day you got a diagnosis or the day some big news happened, like when Kennedy was assassinated, my mother can tell you exactly where she was, what she was doing. I remember exactly where I was uh, uh, when uh, uh, September 11th uh, happened. I was at work. I remember the building. I remember my desk. I remember the, the TV hung, uh, hanging up uh, the wall. I remember who was with me because that was a very highly emotionally charged complex of experiences. The emotions I was having, the visual experiences, the conversations I was having, the thoughts coming through my mind. So that's what I remember. Um, and experiences leading up to death are very, very, very highly emotionally charged. So those are the ones that um, yeah, we can make a chemical metaphor. They are chemical compounds with their outer orbitals primed for covalent connections, They're highly reactive uh, mental contents that are primed to attaching to something else. Uh, that's what emotionally charged experiences are. They are very, very reactive chemical substances. Whatever they touch, they will react with it and form bonds. Uh, and that's why we remember them. Uh, because they are reactive and they will attach to whatever chain of associations is going on in the cognitive periphery uh, of mind. Um, so those are the emotionally charged complexes that will, that will attach to new alters because they are reactive. Um, and because they are associated with death experiences, uh, they will overwhelm. And then that's what a new alter will remember, that one particular death. Uh, and then it will say, well, but it's just one life. Well, yeah, because that one had a particularly highly reactive complex that was released from its dissociative boundaries. So it's the chemical compound now drifting in a solution, ready to establish co covalent bonds with whatever is in the neighborhood. And in, in mental language, it's a, it's a psychic complex ready to, to be uh, tied into any chain, any associative chain with whatever cognitive contents are happening around. It, it, it has this attaching power, this reactive uh, property. So that's why I would suggest that in the many cases in which only one life is remembered, uh, um, there is only the remembrance of one life because it's that cognitive complex emotionally charged with the experiences immediately prior to death. Okay, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pay, play devil's advocate. Uh, I've read some of the reincarnation literature. I'm not an expert, but there are a lot of cases where it's not a traumatic death. It's a pretty trivial death, like the case of uh, Martin Martin's uh, studied by uh, Jim Tucker. I mean, uh, Ryan Hammonds, the guy who remembers Marty's life, uh, remembers pretty banal, uh, banal details like... Um, Marty's, uh, Marty bought his daughter a dog when she was six, and she didn't like the dog, so, she had, so he had it returned. Uh, the street where Marty lived, uh, the restaurant where uh, Marty ate. I mean, uh, st stuff that's pretty trivial, and I don't think he had a traumatic death. So how would you account for that? Well, I'm speaking in terms of statistics. I think statistically, if you look at the cases of reincarnation, um, you will see a significant proportion being associated with traumatic events, uh, including the cases in which there are this body, this, these marks in your body that you have from birth that seem to correspond to whatever wounds were received uh, during death, a bullet wound, and then you have a birthmark in the exact place where the person was shot. 
uh, statistically, a lot of it seems to be associated with uh, very highly emotionally charged events, which doesn't mean that they are all like that. And, and not all my memories uh, uh, reflect what happened in September 11th, 2001. I remember pretty trivial things that just happened to, to have been captured in some cognitive chain of associations. I remember being one year old, sitting on a baby bath and pushing a toy ship around. I have clear memories of that. Um, I, I remember being one year old on my anniversary, on my birthday, sitting on a, on a large bed. Uh, it, it was my uh, grandparents' bed in their weekend home. I was sitting there and there were all these gifts uh, around me still wrapped up. And I remember that excitement, like, oh, my God, all this stuff. <laughs> At one year old, I couldn't even speak. Um, and I have other very trivial memories from later in life. So, you know, statistically, certain mental contents get captured in cognitive associations. Uh, but also statistically, uh, you tend to remember more uh, the ones that have emotional charge connected with them. So I, I don't see it as particularly significant that a small percentage of people remember events from a life that has already ended. Notice that the life has to have ended because for as long as the other person is still alive, then their mental contents are still surrounded by their dissociative boundary. They are not uh, anymore available in solution so they can react to things outside. So you can only remember things from people who passed were dead because their mental contents now are released, not encapsulated in a dissociative boundary, which goes a long way to explaining why mediums seem to only talk to the dead. Why doesn't a medium talk, talk to somebody alive on the other side of the world? Sometimes that happens, but it seems to be a lot more difficult. Uh, and why don't you remember a parallel incarnation? You know, if we are all alters of one universal mind, why don't I remember what happened to a Chinese a month ago? Um, because there are two dissociative boundaries involved and things get a lot easier when there is only one. And there has to be at least only one, uh, at least one uh, for us to be able to talk about it. Because if there is none, then there is nobody around <laughs> to talk about it. So one is the sweet spot. Um, and it's statistically, you, you, you're, you're bound to, to be able to mention a case uh, of remembrance that is not emotionally charged and lots of cases that are uh, uh, cognitively, uh, no, emotionally charged. Um, I, I don't think any of these necessarily implies that, that substance dualism is correct and that there is some kind of disembodied soul that leaves one body and enters another um, after the death of the first and the birth of, of the second. Um, I think things work almost as though that narrative were true. Uh, and in that sense, that narrative has been useful for centuries uh, in the East. It's a useful narrative, uh, but it's a convenient fiction. Like the many convenient fictions in science, nature behaves as though there were some kind of disembodied ghost that left one body at death and entered another at birth. And, and often that's good enough. But if you dig down and you try to, you know, really look into the details and the philosophical and scientific problems that are raised by this narrative, I think uh, you can account much better for the facts if you understand this as just a cognitive play in the one mind of nature in which mental contents get detached or attached to certain chains of cognitive associations. And some of those are released upon death and get captured uh, during birth. Uh, well, I'm not a substance dualist. Uh, I think that a hierarchy of dissociation is plausible, like a dream within a dream. I've had many of those. That is coherent. It's not incoherent to suggest that. The problem it has is that um, if there is a hierarchy of dissociation, why don't we see a corresponding appearance? Um, in other words, if we as people are just the tip of a hierarchy of dissociation, why don't we look like trees when a branch of the tree dies and the rest of the tree is still visible? Um, that's what you would expect in a hierarchy of dissociations. You would expect that the rest of the hierarchy would also have an appearance, a physical correlate. 
but when we die, nothing seems to be left. Now, I'm not saying that I it's mean... incoherent. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm not saying that it's incoherent to postulate the hierarchy. It's totally coherent. It may very well be the case that evolutionarily speaking, our cognitive apparatus simply didn't evolve to pick up on the rest of the hierarchy because it doesn't have a bearing on our, on our survival. That's entirely coherent. Whether it's plausible, now, now it's a matter of subjective uh, taste. I, I tend to think it's less plausible than the alternative that um, if there is a hierarchy, the rest of that hierarchy is not anything commensurate with personal identity. It's the next level in the hierarchy, is something transpersonal, even impersonal. It's something that you could identify as part of nature, but you would never associate with a individual being, with a, a individual life of some form. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, and I'll stop beating this horse, but <laughs> arguably it's memory okay. might memory might not have uh, neural correlates so we might have some some indications to think that there are things that don't have an image but yeah I'll, I'll, that's correct I'll move it yeah uh i'll move it over to jack now thanks man okay um i got a fairly long question i tried to uh shorten it as far as i could but um bear with me um sure. it's from the metacast rep it's uh it's from Federica, and he or she asks, um, this critical question is about Bernardo's choice to introduce the idea of dissociation as a way to explain the decombination of universal consciousness into each of our personal psyches. Bernardo rejects a common objection to idealism, namely the natural order objection, which questions how the stable and orderly natural laws that we observe in nature can represent something as notoriously unstable and disorderly as thoughts and emotions at the level of a supposed universal consciousness. Bernardo rejects this objection like so. And then he quotes you. Um, the misconception here, of course, is that of anthropomorphization to attribute to universal consciousness as a whole cognitive characteristics known only in small diso dissociated segments of it, um, such as human beings, for example. <clears throat> uh, it's not one doing quite exactly that same thing, anthropomorphizing universal consciousness, but attributing to it the mental health condition DID which is indeed known only in beings such as us humans. No, I don't think it is anthropomorphization. Um, if we recognize certain general processes in nature um, that are not tied exclusively to humans, otherwise it would be anthropomorphization to say that my cat here next to me has metabolism just because I have metabolism. Well, why would he have? Now, the, the difference is that metabolism is a fairly general process in nature, and it applies to me just as much as it applies to him. Now, notice that it's a completely different thing to say that my cat is thinking thoughts like mine right now, because now we are talking about specific instantiations of a general thing. My cat has thoughts, but the instances of thinking in him are almost certainly different from the instances of thinking in me. And to attribute the, the characteristics of my human instances to him, that's anthropomorphization. But it's not anthropomorphization to recognize the generality of certain processes in nature, such as thinking and metabolism. Um, in the case of dissociation, it is us who pathologize uh, dissociation. We call it a disease. Uh, and the proof of this is that there are human societies in which that's not done, in which the, the, the exact opposite is done. In many preliterate societies, a person who in the West, Western culture, would be institutionalized for severe DID, they become the shamans, they become the intermediaries who go talk to the spirits, uh, the guides to the tribe. Um, it, 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 dissociation is seen as a gift uh, from divinity. 
Um, but of course, they have the social structures to allow a highly dissociated person to be functional in that society. You don't ask the shaman to hunter gather. No, the, the shaman lives in a hut just outside the edges of the tribe. He is given gifts. He is given food, uh, means to survive, uh, um, and he just uses his gift. So I don't mean to attribute to the universal mind a pathology. The, patholo the pathologizing of dissociation is culture-bound. It's a Western thing. Uh, but the underlying process is certainly general enough across human beings from all cultures. Um, and it's difficult to ask a rat if the, ra if the rat is dissociated. Uh, but I think with the evolution of neuroimaging, we will come to a point where we'll be able to establish that uh, dissociation is just as widespread throughout life as metabolism, which is life. Um, and in that case, it's not anthropomorphization at all to say that, well, this process that seems to be everywhere in nature, insofar as we can discern, is actually everywhere in nature. <laughs> Um, it's not anthropomorphization anymore that it is anthropomorphization to say that my cat metabolizes or that my cat has thoughts. What is anthropomorphization is to say my cat has thoughts like mine, instances of the generic process that are like my instances. That's what anthropomorphization is, but I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that the instance of dissociation in the cosmic mind looks like the instance of dissociation in a patient with DID. Of course it doesn't. These are probably incommensurable, uh, but both are dissociation, just like my cat and I both have metabolism. Right, so you make the distinction between dissociation at a cosmic level and dissociation when it happens in humans. So it's like the process is, is not the same, but the general idea is the same. Well, it, the underlying process is the same, but the instances are not the same. The particular instances are not the same. The particular way in which the process unfolds is not the same, but both, both are dissociative in the sense of the effects of the process. Both have similar effects, which is a, a specific type of forgetfulness um, and the creation of seemingly disjoint uh, centers of awareness. And, and these are very generic things, just like protein folding and transcription uh, are generic things in metabolism that I share with the amoeba in my toilet. Uh, but the particular instances are different. The types of proteins that are folded in my organism are very different from the types of proteins that are folded uh, in the cytoplasm of, of an amoeba. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, also, by the way, for everybody uh, listening in right now, um, you do not have to wait to the end to ask Bernardo questions. If you want to ask him a question right now or say something nice, that's also fine. Uh, there's a hand icon in the bottom of your screen. Uh, just tap it and we'll uh, add you to the queue. Um, that being said, let's go to the... Let's see if I can find another criticism. Um, well, dreams of electric sheep. Um, they ask... What do you think the best argument against analytic idealism is? So what do you think? Have you come across a good one? Well, the, the, the argument that requires the most subtle response is the argument that um, our body is constituted of living cells. Um, and you, if you harvest those living cells uh, in the proper way and you culture them in the right way, they continue to grow outside of your body. Um, even neurons can be grown in a Petri dish. And at, at first sight, this seems to suggest uh, that we are, our consciousness, our inner life is the result, the result of combination. Because if neurons can be harvested and grown in a Petri dish, um, then they are individual in some form. And if that is so in a Petri dish, then they should be individuals in our brains. And if that is so, then their individual inner lives have to combine because I'm not aware of the inner life of any particular neuron in my mind, only of my unitary inner life. Um, and that's the argument that the more thoughtful philosophers uh, who engage in panpsychism uh, put forward uh, against idealism. Um, 
I heard this personally uh, personally from um, Hedda, Hedda Moch, um, who brought this uh, up. And, and it's the argument that requires uh, the more thoughtful, careful answer. It's not something that you can just you know, dismiss like most arguments used by physicalists that you, you know, within 30 seconds, it's over. Uh, uh, this one requires a thoughtful uh, response because it is a thoughtful argument. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I've got someone on the stage who wants to ask you a question. It's Awakening Soul. Um, Awakening Soul, are you there? I don't think you have to unmute yourself first before you can speak. Okay, uh, I'll just go on. I'll just leave him on stage. Maybe he'll Maybe it will work in a couple of minutes, so I'll, I'll just ask another question. I found this, I think, on a YouTube channel, Too Late for the Gods. Um, the summary of the question is, there is no evidence of transpersonal consciousness that can stand up to the uh, atheistic refutation of it, therefore idealism is unfounded. So it's rather <laughs> a, a more <laughs> statement than anything else, but... This is... A <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Should, do you want me to reply to this? Sure, yeah. Nay, sh sure. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. Um, there's plenty of evidence for transpersonal consciousness. Um, there is a whole field of psychology called transpersonal psychology, has been around for decades and has, you know, voluminous uh, literature. Um, if you want to experience it yourself, deep psychedelic states are profoundly transpersonal. Um, and I don't mean by these people who take mushrooms or LSD and go to the park uh, to enjoy the colors. That, that's not a psychedelic trip. This is not even the atrium of a psychedelic trip. Uh, you're just putting your toes on, on the bee, on, on, in the water, if you know what I mean. But when you jump into the water, uh, many psychonauts would describe the experience at certain part of the experience as transcending humanness. Um, it, when you get past that, you become aware that you're no longer human. Um, your humanness is left behind. Some, some describe, it, describe it as punching through a kind of flower, going through a chrysanthemum. Terence McKenna used to talk about it as a chrysanthemum. And if you punch through it, if you go beyond the chrysanthemum, then you are in transpersonal space and you are no longer human, you are no longer localized uh, in space-time. And that's a very palpable, lived, concrete experience that is, epistemically speaking, above any kind of uh, theoretical abstraction and conceptualization. So that's the first answer. Now, even if that, was that were not the case, even if there were no, there wasn't, there were no evidence of transpersonal states, which scientifically we have plenty of. The literature is, you cannot read the entire literature yourself in a lifetime. Let's put it that way. But let's, so this person just doesn't know what he's talking about or she. Um, but let's, just for the sake of argument, pretend that that weren't the case. Let's pretend that there is absolutely no evidence, scientific or otherwise for transpersonal states. Is the conclusion still valid? No, it doesn't follow from, from the premise. It, it, it's a non sequitur because you have to compare idealism with the alternatives. Uh, um, if you compare idealism with uh, constitutive panpsychism, there is no evidence that uh, fundamentally separate minds combine uh, to, force, to form seemingly unitary higher level minds. It's pure uh, uh, theoretical speculation. Um, let's now compare it to physicalism. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever. There are only assumptions, but there is no evidence whatsoever that purely physical systems, exhaustively definable in, or characterizable in terms of quantities alone, have ever produced the qualities of experience. There is no evidence that any computer has experienced the redness of red. The, to postulate that that's what happens is a theoretical abstraction. It's totally independent of evidence. Um, so if 
even if there were no evidence for transpersonal states, and there's plenty of it, but even if there weren't, on this base alone, idealism would still be entirely on par with physicalism and constitutive panpsychism. Now let's take a step further. Let's look at more indirect evidence. Um, there is no evidence for combination. There is no evidence for emergence of qualities from quantities. Is there relevant evidence for decomposition? Lo and behold, there is. Even if there were no evidence for transpersonal states, there is hardcore neuroimaging and clinical scientific evidence that minds can decompose into multiple centers of awareness. So even if the premise of this person's question were true, and it's obviously not for anybody who has ever even glanced at the literature, even then idealism would still be the best of the options we have conceived thus far. So no, this, this, this is not a good criticism. <laughs> Let's not waste more time on this. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I just I found it. I thought it was it was it was interesting. Um, let me see. Um, <clears throat> this is the kind of criticism that uh, somebody yeah. who is a poor thinker, but think of themselves as great thinkers. This is what comes out, and then this this happens every now and then. Usually, my audience doesn't have people like this, so I'm surprised you found it, uh, presumably in one of my videos. Um, I'm very proud of my audience because they, they, they are not this type. Um, but if you go beyond, you know, this sort of exclusive club, uh, you will find a lot of people who, who express themselves this way. Poor thinkers who think they are great thinkers. <laughs> yeah, there is a name in science for this. It's called the um, Donning-Kruger effect. I've, uh, yeah. maybe, I've, I've probably maybe. bungled the names. Huh? That's that's the one. That's the one. Okay, yeah. That, so it's it's well characterized. Uh, we, we know how this kind of question arises in the mind of a human being. Not only the question, because this is not a question. This is a statement. This is somebody who is who, who has a position that he's defending. He's not really asking a question. And and the 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 degree of uh, belief in one's own position that has to do with the Dunning Kruger effect. Uh. I know this person. They they make videos on YouTube criticizing you all the time. They're not a part of your family. Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I shall not watch them. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to to go too hard on someone. But uh, I have seen this kind of questions before, and um, and you know, you know, with time, you understand the dynamics playing there. Great. Thank you. Do you? Uh... Can we, can we try Awakening Soul again? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. My uh, browser was blocking Discord earlier. No problem, mate, no problem, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, my question has a little bit of a foundation, but it's not too long, and I'm happy to clarify anything um, if it's not clear at first. So I, I think all idealist philosophers agree that materialism arose when uh, basically we began abstracting out our own thinking agency from observation and uh, investigation of nature and natural processes. Um, so, for example, Newton, uh, you know, developed his color theory when he set up a prism, ob observed white light passing through the prism, and then observed that it differentiated into the colors of the rainbow. Um, since he abstracted himself and his own participation in the experiment out from the experiment, uh, he concluded that the white light contains all the colors of the rainbow within it, and the prism simply draws these colors out of the white light. Um, so my question is, is it fair to say that philosophers of, let's say, blind or instinctive will also make a similar move uh, when they conclude that they can discern this uh, will in itself in the absence of any cognitive element? Uh, so, for example, if you know one of them were to enter into a sensory deprivation chamber 
uh, and then they observe their endogenous surging will impulses um, in the absence of any sensory input. Um, and then they conclude that they've experienced the blind will in itself that lies behind all of the world's appearances. Uh, would, would this not also be a case of ignoring their own cognitive intention to enter into that state, their cognitive discernment of the state's meaning, uh, their formation of memories during that state, which can be later or later be recalled and uh, conveyed to others in some limited form. Um, and so so by concluding that they experienced only the blind will impulse in itself, have they not abstracted out their own uh, self-aware thinking agency like the materialist does with the prism uh, color experiment? Yes. It is inherent to the scientific process, which I believe to be very valuable, to do one's best to insulate the thing you are experimenting on from your personal agency. Um, Newton was proven right, not in the sense that colors or qual qualities are out there in the world, um, materialism would say that's not true. Um, but when you shine light through a prism and you measure the energy of the photons that come on the other side, you will find them, dis them dispersed, the energy dispersed across discrete bands, um, which shows that th there was electromagnetic oscillations uh, with a spectrum of frequencies in white light. And what the prism does, it just pries apart those frequencies, uh, which ultimately then corresponds to the experience of different colors. So there is a sense in which Newton was right. Um, Goethe, um, about 100 years after Newton, um, he poo pooed Newton. He said Newton, Newton was an idiot, he doesn't know, didn't know what he was doing. And he offered a different theory of color, something Goethe is not known for. Everybody thinks of Faust and poetry and theatrical plays when we speak the name Goethe. But Goethe tried to be a scientist. And uh, very luckily, he was not taken seriously because he mistook science with phenomenology. He, he was so um, embedded in the notion that nature is qualitative as an artist for him this was uh, you know taken for granted the nature is qualitative not quantitative so to speak of frequencies has no meaning unless we are actually speaking about the descriptions of colors and he he conflated science with phenomenology um, and that was his error he came up he came up with a theory of light that just made absolutely no sense uh, that could be experimentally refuted in 30 seconds, the refutation of which he refused to carry out himself. Um, so I don't think Newton was right, uh, was wrong in every sense. There was a very important sense in which the story he came up with was a very, very, very convenient fiction that will still apply to this day. Um, regarding introspection of Schopenhauerians, um, what you are saying is that because the experience of the blind will is ultimately had and described by a personal mind, then it, epistemically speaking, has no value. Um, we should not take it seriously. The problem is that you can say the same about any experience, including the experience of looking through a telescope or looking down a microscope or working out a mathematical problem, um, personal experience is the only carrier of existence that we can ever know for as long as we are alive. And therefore, personal experience is the only carrier of anything that has any meaning for a social or cultural uh, conversation. We are, as individuals, ultimately the carrier of any experience. And therefore, 
whatever theory of nature we have ultimately will always rest on personal experience. So if we are to follow your argument rigorously and strictly, we have to abandon all knowledge. Um, everything has to be discarded because it, for everything, ultimately, individuals are the carriers of whatever evidence, of whatever reasoning, uh, whatever we come up with as a story to make sense of nature can, can be discarded. So, and we don't do that. Why don't we do that? Because there are still ways to sort of sort the wheat from the chaff. There are ways to refine the confidence we have in something that ultimately is scared by personal experience. For instance, the repetition of experiments. All the results of all the experiments ever carried out in the history of the universe have been carried in the, in the personal minds of experimentalists. Uh, but if you have multiple separate groups of experimentalists coming up with the same results carried by their own personal experience, you increase the confidence that you are now you're talking about something that, although carried by personal experience, has a foundational, has a ontological existence outside personal experience. Not outside experience, but outside personal experience. So that's one method. It's the repetition of exp experiments by separate groups um, uh, in, in, in separate buildings, you know, different circumstances. Um, another way to refine uh, confidence is an experience, in an experience is uh, introspective discipline. Some people are careful thinkers in the sense that they are very aware of at least many of the ways their minds can deceive them. Um, and they have evolved a certain discipline, a certain attention, a certain inner honesty uh, when they evaluate their own direct experiences uh, to know how much trust they can put on it. Other people are happy to embrace as the ultimate truth the first thought that comes to their minds. Um, and so how do you differentiate which reports are trustworthy and which reports are not? You know, reports from different people, how do you differentiate that? Well, you look at the track record of, of, of the people involved. Um, and then that's used in court of laws. If a, a witness, if the character of that witness can be attacked based on the track record of that person, uh, the testimony is, is, is neglected, is, is discarded. Um, so the same thing applies to our own inner honesty towards ourselves. So going back to Schopenhauerian will, I think regardless of how much our individual prejudices may play into the interpretation of the experience, because all we can communicate is an interpretation. Uh, however much our prejudices may play in that, there is an issue of kind, not of specific instantiation, but an issue of type, an issue of kind that is very reliable. And that is the existence of purely endogenous experience. Even if you don't trust the experience itself, the correctness of the experience itself, even if you say this experience was an illusion, that illusion was still endogenous because it didn't come from your perceptual apparatus. So some experiences do arise endogenously, even if you say they are all deceptions of our own minds, they are all illusory, you can still state with absolute confidence that illusions as they may be, illusions are still experiences, and they arose endogenously, even if they were illusions. And, and that is the critical point Schopenhauer was trying to make. The critical point was that even though Kant was correct that we have no direct access to the noumena, we only have access to the phenomena, to the representations. In other words, what appears on the screen of perception, um, Kant failed to recognize that there is one instance, one thing in nature that we do not depend on phenomena to be acquainted with. And that is us. Uh, merely by being us, we have access to the noumenon that others refer to as us. 
we don't need to perceive that noumenon because we are that noumenon. So if you are in a perfect ideal sensor deprivation chamber, the fact that you still experience endogenously, even if those experiences are illusions, and even if your interpretation of those experiences are completely co colored by your particular prejudices, you still had endogenous experiences. So when you get rid of all the phenomena, there is a noumena that remains, and that's endogenous experience. That is the point, and that's an indisputable point. So the next step, that one you can dispute. I think it's an extremely plausible step, but that one you can dispute, and that's the step of extrapolation. That's when Schopenhauer says, if there is something it is like to be me in the absence of all representations, and I will call it the will. If you don't like the name, call it X I, or, or, or E for endogenous. I don't care. I don't care if E is illusion or not. It's experienced and it arises from within. It's endogenous. That's all that matters. The next step is when you say, I will extrapolate E to nature at large. That you can dispute, that can be argued, not the existence of E. E exists. Even if it's an illusion, it exists even by virtue of being an illusion, because an illusion only exists insofar as it is experienced. An illusion exists only insofar as it is experienced, because it's an illusion. Um, but the extrapolation step needs now argumentation. It's not... Uh, it doesn't carry absolute certainty with it, but I think the argumentation is eminently plausible. Um, from the outside in, the noumenon we call us looks like matter, the matter in my body. This, this is material, this is material stuff. Uh, but when I am in an ideal sensor deprivation chamber, there is no matter, there is only E. So E, when looked from the outside, when observed from the outside, looks like matter. Okay, what about the matter of the rest of the universe? Is the rest of the universe also material like my body? Yeah, it's actually the same, the same kinds of atoms and force fields as the matter of my body. There's carbon out there, there is hydrogen and oxygen out there, nitrogen, and all this stuff is out there just as it is in my body. And there is no scientific reason to establish a fundamental difference in type between the matter of my body and the matter of the rest of the universe. So if the matter of my body is what E looks like when observes from the outside, then so is the matter in the rest of the universe. So the rest of the universe also has E. That's the argument, you see? So you, you, you depend on logic and reason when you're taking the step of extrapolation and you depend on nothing when you are merely recognizing that there is E. Because even if E is an illusion, it doesn't matter. It still plays the role you need it to play, which is that there is endogenous experience totally independent of perception. Uh, Awakening Soul, do you have anything to, to add to that? You, can, you guys can duke it out a, a bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would really appreciate um, uh, following up. So, so I thank you for that detailed comment, Bernardo. Um, you know, I, I think my question, I tried to pack a lot into my question, so it probably uh, gave a different impression of where I was going with it. Uh, but I, I completely agree that Newton's color theory and Schopenhauer's, um, you know, blind will theory, if you want to call it that, they both have epistemic value. Um, but my, I guess my um, my underlying point would be that they're, in addition to saying that there's a will impulse that's experienced as noumena, uh, which I agree with, we also have to say there's a self-aware cognitive element uh, embedded within that will impulse. And then we end up with something closer to, uh, let's say, Hegel's uh, evolutionary idealism, which is, of course, aligned with Christian theism, uh, body, soul, spirit, willing, feeling, thinking as the triunity you know, the ground of reality itself. Um, so that's that's where I was going with it. And and then I would say, you know, it, it's that triunity of willing, feeling, thinking 
that evolves through nature and culture and especially through the human being who has awakened to the essential world process in his own thinking. Um, and then, then I would say, so re removing out that thinking agency is certainly easier for applied science and very useful in certain domains. Um, but it's not leading to essential relations. And if, if, if you stop there and if you don't continue reasoning through the experience, and you make that into an ontology like Newton and Schopenhauer did, then that's where the problem arises. And so, so I would, and then, you know, this kind of gets into a, a completely different territory that we can explore maybe another time. But basically, uh, since, since you brought up Goethe, I, I would say I do agree with Goethe's color theory. I think he was right. Um, but we just simply don't have a normal waking cognition doesn't have the perceptual capacity to verify his theory yet. Um, but I, I don't think that's universal to humanity. I think there are individuals who have evolved to higher cognition, uh, which can perceive what is normally super sensible. Um, but yeah, we can get into that another time. But I just wanted to clarify those points. No, I'm, I'm grateful you did that because there's a lot there that I can uh, uh, unconditionally agree with. Um, maybe I come across as more critical of Goethe than I intended to do. Goethe's theory is wrong the moment it's claimed to be a scientific theory and he made that claim in his life. And, and that was the problem because what he actually did was phenomenology a hundred years before phenomenology, a hundred years before Husserl. Husserl. Um, and as a phenomenological approach to color, he was largely right, yes. Um, but he tried to make a scientific theory of it. And he only did that because he didn't quite understand, I think, what science was. Um, from a scientific point of view, the attempt to describe impartially and then model the behavior of nature impartially in a way that can be refuted or confirmed by experiment, Newton was right. In so far as our measurement capabilities were at, in his time and all the way into the 20th century. Later with you know, what motivated quantum theory was something that Newton's um, color theory couldn't account for. So that's when it faced its limits. And then we came up with quantization to explain why we don't have a uh, continuous rainbow sometimes you only have very discrete bands of electromagnetic energy uh, related to certain orbital jumps which are quantized and so all, all that good stuff so for a hundred years we know re Newton was actually wrong <laughs> uh, but he was right enough for 300 years uh, and and Goethe was not as far as an ability to predict um, objectively and impartially the behavior of nature but he was right insofar as he attempted to model human experience, the human experience of color. And so he was, you know, he played the role of uh, Husserl a hundred years before Husserl and kudos to him for doing that. It's just that he sold it wrong um, in his time. Now, I agree with you that, uh, Look, we, we always carry our prejudices uh, in the interpretation of our experiences, and now we have our, our experiences. So on that account, if we reject Schopenhauer because of the prejudices he brought to bear in his interpretation of the experience of the will, then we have to reject everything else, all of science, all of philosophy, because everything is carried by personal experience. Having said that, um, we learn at an individual and a collective, collective level over time about the subtle nuances of our own mentation. We start realizing all the myriad subtle refined ways in which we deceive ourselves. Uh, we start paying more attention to nuance, important salient nuances that passed us by before. And there's a name for this. It's, it, it's called growing up. 
it's it's called maturing um, and we mature not only as individuals but as a culture hopefully knock on wood three times um, and in that sense i agree with you that uh, hegel he hit on something correct when he interpreted history as a dialectic process by means of which we get closer and closer and closer to absolute knowledge, to the absolute, as, as he called it. Um, he was in Western thought, well, he was not the first because he was inspired by Schiller um, in his lifetime. Schiller was the first one to propose that our understanding of the human condition and the, con the human condition itself changes and evolves. Schiller was a poet, so he couldn't work it out in the rigorous ways that are demanded by science and philosophy. But you, 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 you can trace the root of that thought in modern Western philosophy back to Schiller. Perhaps you can trace it back to the Greeks, but I, I'm talking about, you know, since the Renaissance. If we limit ourselves to everything that happened after the, the Renaissance, we can trace the idea of an evolutionary process back to Schiller. And it was systematized by Hegel, and at the same time, at the same time, made completely impenetrable because of the absolutely hideous way in which Hegel wrote. And I, I, I have a relationship of love and hate with Hegel. I love his ideas. I hate the gratuitously obscure way he wrote. It's like he made a point to be obscure intentionally. I, I, I disdain that profoundly. I find that elitist and, and anything that I associate with elitism, I, I, I disdain <laughs> um, because I'm just a peasant boy <laughs> born in a faraway land of dreams. So I, I disdain that kind of approach. Uh, but I will acknowledge to you that he was the first one to systematize the notion that epistemically speaking, we evolve as individuals and as a culture, and that society is a tool to that end, and that our ability to make sense of what's going on increases over time. We uncover more and more of the secrets of nature through that dialectic, through the opposition of hypothesis, uh, uh, synthesis, antithesis, and so on. Um, and according to Nietzsche, if there, if there weren't Hegel, there would have been no Darwin. And of course, Darwin is today the most recognizable proponent of this idea of evolution, which he applied only to life, uh, but which Hegel saw as being generally applicable to everything, all, nat all natural processes, certainly all societies, uh, not only the evolution of life uh, and, and organisms as appearances. Um, and I think we we abandoned a very important part of our legacy um, when the, the, the young Hegelians um, turned out to be the only successful splinter group of Hegelian philosophy, because the old Hegelians that represent Hegel's views, uh, they, became, they, they fell out of fashion already in, in the middle of the 19th century. So Hegel was, Hegel was very influential for about 30 years, and then it the speed with which his philosophy was neglected afterwards is just un unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, the man was the official philosopher of Prussia. Uh, and then shortly after he died, he was disregarded, uh, which is incredible. And where did Hegelianism survive? It survived in Marxism with the young Hegelians. Um, it, who applied it only to very down to earth materialistic processes and, and, and lost all the implications to transcendence that Hegelian philosophy had, uh, which is patently clear uh, in the sense that it was adopted by the Protestant churches of Northern Europe. Um, Hegelian philosophy was the official philosophy of, uh, for instance, the Danish uh, 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 reformed uh, church. Um, in the time of uh, Kierkegaard. And we lost all that. And, 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 and that's a great pity. I, I, I hope we, despite my beef against Hegel's way of writing, I think I would have disliked him profoundly as a personality. I don't think I could go have a beer with him. 
uh, like I could with a Kierkegaard, like I could with Spinoza and, and Schopenhauer. I don't think I could go have a beer with Hegel. I think I would dislike him on first sight. Um, but I acknowledge the tremendous value that his philosophy held for some decades in the 19th century as adopted by, by Christian churches in Northern Europe. And it was a great loss to abandon that and, and maintain Hegelianism only in this very coarse material uh, approach of uh, Marxism, which has its value, but it's very limited in the sense that it applies only to certain aspects of human life and experience and, and not to the, to the more salient and important ones when it comes to, to the meaning of life. And, and that's a great pity. I hope we recover that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bernardo. I'm told I have one more response here. So um, I just wanted to say, you know, I agree with practically everything you just said. And I find Hegel, you know, super abstract, um, <laughs> to say the least. And it's not my favorite form of philosophy uh, either. But I just want to shift gears really quickly because I'm wondering if we can you know, take this idea of evolution of consciousness and cognition you know, out from the abstract domain and more into the living, you know, concrete domain of whether we can actually perceive this happening uh, or, or has it already happened. And uh, so related to that, I wanted to go to your point that you made about hierarchical dissociation. Um, so, you know, you said there's no, uh, there's no reason to say it's only MAL and then uh, humans. There are also dissociated perspectives within humanity or uh, below humanity, lower organisms. And I would say also like our organs, tissues, cells uh, are examples of that. But then what about, um, you know, perspectives above humanity, between humanity and MAL, uh, which I would say are much more lucid, awakened perspectives they're still dissociated in their own way, but certainly not to the extent that we are. Um, and and as I completely reject Kant, so I would say they're not on some other side of reality that's opaque to our consciousness, but rather that their higher perspectives are concentric with our own, and that we can grow into these higher perspectives uh, through the evolution of cognition. Um, and then, you know, from that perspective, from those higher perspectives, we could actually uh, perceive the data points, you could say, necessary to confirm something like Goethe's uh, color theory. So I just wanted to see, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, th that there are levels of consciousness that in some sense you could characterize as higher. I think the chance that that's the case is almost one. Uh, 0 0.99999 dot ad infinitum. Um, why? Because it would be extraordinarily unlikely that we represent the peak perspective um, within the universal mind. I mean, we are monkeys evolved in a rather insignificant rock of a typical galaxy in a typical corner of the universe. Why? would our state of consciousness, the particular dissociative configuration that we embody, be the highest level uh, in the sense of rich of apprehension? Uh, it's it's, it's a, an effective practical certainty that that's not the case. Um, I don't think that necessarily implies hierarchies. Um, just different configurations. Um, maybe we impose a hierarchy on it the moment we judge these different configurations according to a particular set of values. Um, but then it's our imposition, the imposition of our own subjective values on the variety of nature. We impose a hierarchy on that. Um, a more objective hierarchy would be one in which when I die and then this this bottom level dissociation that we call life, when that ends, then I would fall back in a higher level of dissociation that it's not personal, but also not universal. 
uh, and then when that level would come to an end, then it would fall back into a even less personal, less individual, more impersonal level, and so on and so forth, until you get to the Godhead, to, to, you know, to, to universal consciousness, to MAL. Um, is, is, is it possible that that is the case? It, it is certainly possible. It is coherent. Um, most of the philosophical traditions on this planet, and I'm speaking philosophical in the sense that includes religion, because the separation between religion and philosophy is only a few hundred years old uh, in, in the West. Before that, there was no such separation. So most of the philosophical slash religious traditions on this planet propose that there is just such a hierarchy. The tree of life uh, in, in, in um, Judaism, um, uh, the, the seven spheres, the angelic spheres of, uh, of um, uh, Western, how do you call that? I forgot the name, uh, uh, the, the occult Western philosophies. Uh, uh, the name. Esotericism. Esotericism, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you can discern a lot of that um, in the Indian scriptures, uh, in the Vedas. Some of that gets filtered out in the Upanishads, but if you go back to the original mythology, you can find uh, a lot of hints towards hierarchies. Um, Christian mythology um, also entails hierarchies. There are you know, there's us, there are angels, archangels, uh, and then there is the Trinity and the Godhead as the sort of the climatic point, source uh, of the Trinity. Um, so the fact that this intuition has sort of a reason in human minds across cultures, across times, across geographies, suggests that there is some kind of core of truth to it. The problem is that... Um, I live in the West in the early 20th century, and, and to argue for it on the basis that I just did is not considered acceptable, is not considered value, uh, valid according to the, to the epistemic values held by our culture today. So, so I don't do it. I don't do it because uh, why will I try to fight a fight uh, when I know that uh, the rules are biased against me? I don't fight that fight. I fight the fights I know I can win uh, that play with the rules. And the rules now are such, and they are subjective, but they say that uh, a hypothesis shall only be considered if there is some form of objective empirical evidence for it. And right now, I don't see objective empirical evidence in nature to suggest a hierarchy, because the kind of thing I would expect to see is that again, that a human body would be like the limb of a tree. The limb can die, but the tree stays behind visible, even if the limb disappears. We don't see that, which doesn't mean that, that hierarchy thinking is untrue, because our cognitive apparatus didn't evolve to pick out everything that is philosophically salient. It evolved only to pick out what is relevant for our survival. And maybe these other levels of the hierarchy have no bearing on our ability to survive. They are irrelevant. And if that's the case, we, our cognitive apparatus, our perceptual apparatus would not have evolved to pick it out. We would remain blind to it, just like we are blind to air because it's irrelevant. It's everywhere all the time. Uh, maybe not in the future we'll, if we manage to destroy the planet and pollute everything. But in the world in which we evolved, air was everywhere. So we don't pick it up because it's irrelevant. It's, it's an invariant uh, in the game of life. So it is possible that these hierarchies are there and we just don't have the perceptual apparatus or the cognitive apparatus to pick it out. And that's all there is to it. We just don't pick it out, but it's there. It's possible. And if you ask me what I think is more likely, that it is there, that it's not there, I would even tell you it's, for me personally, even though I'm not going to defend this, for me personally, when I look in the mirror and I'm honest to myself, I think it's more likely that it is there. Thank you, both of you. Thanks. Uh, can I make a 30-second like, um, concluding remark? It'll be your last. <laughs> For today yeah no but, but make, it's make just, it quick it's just, 
it's just a suggestion um, for Bernardo. You know, I, I would recommend you look into Rudolf Steiner, and um, you you've probably heard of him in Philosophy of Freedom, but he also goes into spiritual science, is what he calls it, which reconciles Western philosophy, science, with Western esotericism and spiritual tradition. And he lays out a whole path of how we can develop imagination, inspiration, intuition, which allows us to perceive those more subtle forms of, of reality um, that, you know, that would point to these higher hierarchies of, of perspectives. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But thank you very much for, for, your, you. Um, for your responses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Awakening Soul. Um, Raman. Hey. Um, okay, I'll move on to a question from uh, Ryan. Um, they say, uh, Dr. Castro, can you help me? Uh, you and Professor Telly t talk about, um, I, I, I assume you're, they're referring to a video on, uh, you'd made on psychedelics. Um, in several subjects, the observed mean differences between drug and pl placebo conditions even go in the wrong direction. And uh, Schartner et al., uh, 2017. Can you help and show me? Uh, can you help uh, show me the, these results in the scientific? Paper? Uh, read the paper that you just mentioned. If you read the paper that the person is alluding to, the 2017 paper, uh, it's stated there. Uh, they show statistical results, so the means uh, for the change in what the researchers call complexity or entropy. It's just brain noise. It's, it's TV static in the brain. They show that statistically, there is an increase of 0 0.001 in a scale of 0 to 100. There is this absolutely minuscule increase uh, in brain noise during the psychedelic experience. It's the only thing they reliably found to increase uh, in the brain because brain activity goes down. So the only thing that increases is brain TV static noise. It's preposterous to try to account for the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience on that experience on that basis, but that that is the proposal. But then they go ahead and, and they, when they show the data, you can see that for some of the drug placebo pairs, the correlation is inverted. Uh, brain noise uh, uh, goes down a little bit, and those people also had the psychedelic trance, also had the psychedelic experience. Uh, now, scientifically, in general, uh, you're interested in the mean, so the average, and there is a very, very minuscule average increase. Uh, but in this case, if the suggestion, which they don't make explicit, but of course, it's the reason why this paper is read at all. If the suggestion is that it's increase in brain noise levels, this tiny minuscule increase that accounts on physicalism terms for the psychedelic experience, then how come did those pairs for which brain noise reduced, how come those people also had the psychedelic experience? So that's a case in which one black swan uh, defeats the theory that all swans are white. Um, so in terms of statistic significance, they can, the numbers are such that they can show statistical significance. But again, statistical significance is a completely arbitrary threshold it was like finger in the air by somebody in the 1930s. Um, so it, there are many academic papers today that will refuse any paper whose conclusions are based on statistical significance because there is a growing awareness in science now that you can basically prove anything because it's an arbitrary threshold. So if you just pre-filter or manipulate your data in apparently legitimate ways, but in ways that will lead to crossing that arbitrary threshold, you can prove anything. Um, and, but it still leaves the question open. What about those people reported in the 2017 paper uh, uh, for which brain noise levels decreased? Because the result is based on the statistical average and there is a distribution around the average, a normal distribution. And some of the subjects in, in that distribution had less uh, uh, brain noise um, and, and, and still had the trance. So the, don't ask me to show you that. Read the paper. <laughs> Just read the darn paper. <laughs> I need to make a bio break, uh, Jack. Can we take one minute, exactly one minute pause? I, I'll be right back. And maybe you can choose your next question in the meantime. Is it okay? It's okay. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. 
Welcome back. Um, Welcome back. I have a question that's uh, tangentially related to the previous question. Uh, it's a technical neuroscience question. So um, I read this paper by uh, Talia Zuki, uh, 2021, uh, on uh, uh, DMT, the neural correlates of DMT. Um, they showed increased uh, spectral power in delta, theta, and gamma bands. But I think spectral power is not equivalent to activity because uh, the amplitude of uh, the signal is left out, right? Uh, I don't know the 2021 paper. There is a paper by Tagliazuki from 2014. And there is another paper by the same team, 2016, um, focused on MEG measurements of spectral power. Uh, the paper from 2014 does not allow you to make any statement about the amplitude of a brain activity because it um, this, the methodology discards phase information. So you don't know whether the frequency components will interfere constructively or destructively. So in that 2014 paper, you cannot make any statements uh, about the level of brain activity. You can only talk about uh, brain activity variability. Uh, in other words, you can only talk about acceleration, not speed. Uh, in the 2016 paper uh, by the same group from Imperial College, uh, they, they have shown that there are only decreases in spectral power uh, for LSD um, across all bands. Um, that's significant. Uh, now, the 2021 paper I haven't read. I have not been paying too much attention to the very latest uh, psychedelic uh, literature. Uh, based on what you said, it, it, you know, the, the problem is that you, you cannot extract any reliable conclusion without going through the details of the analysis. I don't know whether if they're only taking spectral power, then what you do is you take the amplitude and you ignore the signal because you square it. And the moment you square it, uh, uh, you're throwing away uh, all the phase information and, and, and the sign of the signal that you're squaring. Uh, so in principle, you cannot make a statement about amplitude of the brain activity signal, but I can only know if I read it. So I, I, I cannot pass judgment uh, on, on a paper I have not read. Um, it, would, it would contradict 10 years of psychedelic research if somebody were to produce a result now saying that the brain activity actually increases, that the amplitude uh, increases uh, in a psychedelic trance, because the opposite result has now been verified for every psychedelic substance that, that's commonly referred to, uh, for every neuroimaging method, EEG, MEG, fMRI, everything, and by multiple groups. So not only Imperial, but uh, Zurich as well, and uh, some groups in South America, so it would be very eyebrow raising if somebody would publish a paper today saying, well, actually psychedelics increase <laughs> brain activity because it's pretty cemented in the literature that it, it doesn't, it does the opposite. Is it okay if I sent you the paper afterwards? Sure, I don't know when I will be able to read it, <laughs> but uh, it's surely okay. Uh, can I ask you about the 2016 uh, paper on DMT? Have you read that? Sure. Uh, LSD, right? No, no, DMT uh, by uh, Timmerman, uh, Timmerman and uh, Carr Terrace uh, in 2016. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure I will know exactly which paper it is because there were a lot of papers published around that time period. But it, it, you can ask, but I, 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 I don't know whether I will be able to give you a, a reliable answer. Yeah, so the, the paper showed uh, reduced oscillatory power in the alpha and beta band, but they also showed um, some increases in theta. So I'm not sure if that means uh, an increase in activity or not. fMRI is much more simple to read. Well, the, you have to look at the total oscillatory activity. So you have to look at the grand total across all bands. Uh, because when we talk about brain activity increasing or decreasing during the psychedelic trance, what we mean by it is the total. Um, some oscillatory activity falls within a certain band of frequencies, others 
fall within other bands of frequency. So if you look band by band, you could have an effect in which within the band, a certain band of frequencies, the oscillatory activity increases. Uh, that wouldn't contradict the conclusion that psychedelics reduce brain activity because you're only looking at a small part of the range of frequencies of activity. You see what I mean? So uh, that there are increases in certain bands does not contradict uh, the general conclusion that uh, brain activity only decreases. You have to look at the grand total across all bands um, and you cannot discard phase information uh, because um, I have to explain now a little more of the, de the details. The brain activity signal is an oscillatory signal. We can model that one signal by decomposing it into a number of frequencies. It's called Fourier decomposition or Fourier analysis. Uh, which basically says that uh, you can approximate any curve, any profile uh, by adding signals of a pure frequency. And so long as you add enough signals of enough different pure frequencies together. Um, when you do that, some of these pure frequencies that you are adding will contribute to approaching the original signal constructively. In other words, they will be increasing the amplitude. But many of these frequencies that you add in the decomposition analysis, they contribute destructively to it by taking away amplitude on certain regions of the signal. That's the only way, for instance, you can approach a square wave with a number of sine waves. In order to sculpt that sharp edge of the square wave, you have to subtract lots of frequencies around that region. Otherwise, you don't get the square wave. Now, that means that those frequencies of the spectrum will be having a negative contribution to the, to the amount of brain activity. If you ignore that and you just add the entire spectrum, then you always get signal of higher amplitude because instead of removing amplitude as you should from some of the frequencies that contribute uh, destructively to the signal, you'll be adding them, which is worse than not, not doing anything with those frequencies. So you have to be careful with that. Spectral power, if you take as the square of the amplitude, it ignores the phase information, whether these frequencies are added or subtracted, supposed to be added or subtracted. Um, and that will only tell you about variability, how much the signal varies. It will not tell you whether the signal actually, the global signal increases or decreases. So with these two disclaimers, uh, um, I would doubt that any result now, after 10 years of confirmation, would produce the conclusion that brain activity in general across all bands taking into account phase information decreases compared to the placebo baseline uh, under the influence of psychedelics. Uh, it would contradict now 10 years of very, very intensive research, a lot of money throw in, thrown into this, a, a lot of money thrown into this. Uh, it would be very, very surprising and it would almost demand an explanation. And I think most people would be skeptical of a result of that kind right now. They would say, well, you, you've done something wrong because it's impossible that 10 years of research for every psychedelic substance with every measurement uh, procedure we know across groups, across countries and continents that they would be wrong. <laughs> okay. and, and look, the greatest sign that uh, the idea that brain activity increases under psychedelic experience is, is, is accepted as refuted, even by physicalist neuroscientists, is precisely the so-called entropic brain hypothesis that we were talking about earlier when Carhart, Harris, and uh, uh, Neil Seth, and a number of others, they basically started looking for something else that has to increase in the brain because they, <laughs> They implicitly accept that activity doesn't increase. They, they looked for activity increases for 10 years and they only found the opposite. So by proposing now the anthropic brain hypothesis since 2018, this is put forward as the key physicalist account for the psychedelic uh, phenomenology. Uh, by proposing that they are, they are 
almost explicitly saying, okay, brain activity doesn't increase. What does increase? Well, it's brain noise. It increases by 0.001 in a scale of zero to 100. And for some people, it actually decreases when they have the experience as well, but we just ignore those. I mean, what bigger acknowledgement could you have uh, of this acceptance that psychedelics do not increase brain activity than the people who have tried to prove that it does for 10 years proposing a totally implausible alternative just because they realize that, oh, darn, brain activity actually doesn't increase. <laughs> anyway. Signal complexity and connectivity. Uh, I'm going to move mm. the question over to These Seth. were other things that were postulated before, but they seem to have abandoned them. They looked at variability, functional coupling, Signal complexity is just brain noise. It's, it's their sophisticated words to hide the fact that what they are talking about is TV static in the brain. Uh, but they didn't pursue the other uh, hypothesis they put forward earlier. There seems to be a sort of congealment around this notion of entropy or brain noise increasing a tiny little bit as the, the most promising physicalist account for the psychedelic trance. I did read a bit. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. I finished. Uh, I did read a paper on functional connectivity to see if, uh, if they could connect it to any subjective effects. And the author basically begrudgingly admits, no, guys, we can't do this. We, we can't correlate these measures to any uh, subjective effects. And if they, even if they could, it wouldn't mean anything. Um, because, you look, if experience is generated by brain activity or metabolism, or is metabolism, then the richness, complexity, and intensity of the experience have to be grounded in an increase in metabolism. Otherwise, you have some kind of disembodied experience. And then they go into the woo-woo land of mysticism, if, if that's what they are proposing. Uh, so regardless of whether the residual experience is more functionally coupled across different brain areas or not, the fact is that the brain is metabolizing less and much more intense, much rich, richer experience is being had. And that's a problem, regardless of functional coupling. Yep. Um, Seb, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I've got a question. So um, the world of phenomena is made up of objects with relative spatio-temporal locations. Uh, not only do we have four dimensions of space-time, but the eight directions that make them up, and the magnitude of the extension of objects over these dimensions. If objects are just transpersonal mental states, mental states of a spaceless, timeless consciousness viewed across a dissociative boundary, it seems at least explaining space and time, and indeed other so-called physical quantities, in terms of a changeless unbound field of conscious awareness is extremely difficult. Do you have any thoughts about how the structure of this changeless, extensionless field of consciousness could give rise to such phenomena? E.g., why do I see my dog three meters in front of me and not three meters above me? For a more extreme example, why are dissociation events that are triggered by two parents located close to... <clears throat> Sorry. Why are dissociation events uh, that are like triggered by two parents located close to those parents and not, for like example, 10,000 miles away? Hope that made sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, uh, Jack, can people see me or just hear me? I'm afraid that people at this moment cannot see you. Only when when I post it to YouTube. So. Okay, okay, because then I I know I cannot start gesticulating gesticulating to talk about space time. Um, okay. Um, when you are flying on an airplane and you're an airplane pilot, and uh, air pressure increases then there is a little dial on an instrument of the dashboard that goes from left to right when the air pressure increases outside the airplane. Why does it go from left to right? You, you can answer me. It's not a rhetorical question. Why right, does the okay, dial go from the left to right? Increasing. Yeah, but why from left to right and not from right to left or from up to down? Why? Uh, well, just because that's how it's designed, right? Exactly. Exactly. So evolution designed our dashboard in the way it did, through myriad trial and error uh, uh, attempts. Um, and it ended up being what it is. Um, that's why you don't see your dog up there. You see your dog down there. 
um, actually your dog is up there. It's just that uh, your retina inverts, your brain inverts the image that your retina sees. <laughs> but but never mind. Okay. You see, it, it could be anything so long as there as there is a bijective correlation between the two domains. So long as what the dial indicates uh, 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 points unambiguously to one event in the world as it is. So long as there is this bijective mapping between the two that reduces or eliminates ambiguity, it doesn't matter if it goes from left to right, up or down, what color it has, how big it is, it doesn't matter. And, and it is what it is because that's what evolution constructed over the eons. There are many things evolution did that are uh, less than reasonable. Uh, there is a nerve in our body that goes through a loop around our chest. It, it could be much shorter, but it goes through a loop and you can trace it back to when we were fish. <laughs> and in the fish, that loop made sense and it worked. Uh, and then we just retained it. It doesn't, that loop doesn't make sense anymore, but it still works. So it, it's still there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. the, the dashboard is arbitrary uh, on the details. Uh, what is important is that it, it be largely bijective, that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between what the dials indicate and the actual states of the world as the world is in itself. Now, we can speak a little more to this um, because space and time, again, are, are the dimensions of the dials on the dashboard. It's that little needle going from left to right. That's a scale. And that scale is what... I mean, Space-time is a scale like that. Uh, it's the dimensions of the dashboard, not the world as it is in itself. Now, we call these scales space and time, and, and there is this thing we call proximity, things that are close to us in space and time, um, things that are in the same place as I am right now, but happened a thousand years ago are very far away, and things um, that happen right now together with me but they're very far away in space, are, they are very far away as well. Um, what can we derive? What does this, this relationship of proximity on the dashboard represent regarding the world as it actually is? Well, the honest answer is, I don't know, and we cannot know for sure, but we can speculate with education. Things that are close in space-time are cognitively close. These are the things we can understand, we can relate to, we feel acquainted with. They are things that are not cognitively strange and incommensurable with our, the qualities of our own mental inner life. Like another person is cognitively close to me because I am a person, I am acquainted with personhood. When another person is close to me, that's personhood. But a, a quasar or a black hole on the edge of the visible universe. That's pretty strange stuff. So that spatiotemporal distance may be a representation of things that are cognitively very distant from us, things that are incommensurable with our own rationality, our own ways of thinking, our ways of relating um, the cognitive contents that we are acquainted with and used to there can be a relationship like that. Now, of course, you can shoot holes in what I just said, because if you put a human being on an alien spaceship and bring that human being to the edge of the universe, uh, it's still cognitively close to me, but very far away in space-time. So this needs refining, um, but at least it gives us a sort of a, a way to try to think about it and then try to poke holes in that way of thinking. But even if we do poke holes in that way of thinking, it still provides us with a starting point. It provides us with a target that we can poke holes in, if you know what I mean. It's a way to, to it's, a, it's a narrative in terms of which to think about what space-time corresponds to in the actual universe, as it actually is. Um, there was some other aspect of your question that I really wanted to answer, but I forgot it now. Can you briefly repeat the, the question, yeah. just touching so on the key points? It was like the eight directions of the of so there's two directions in each dimension. Um, what's the next thing? I think I yeah, covered so that. Like, Numina is uh, like spaceless, timeless, right? So 
we somehow we get physical oh, quantities yeah. from oh. that. Yeah. yeah, just structure. How can there be structure outside space time, right? Uh, which, which I think is a very uh, important question. Sorry, I was just taking a drink of water. Um, it has become very difficult for us in Western culture to think of structure without extension. Uh, what is structure? Structure is variations of state. If the whole of reality had only one uniform state, then there would be no structure. In the same way that uh, the surface of a, a lake without any wind has no structure. It's just unperturbed and flat. It's one state throughout, has no structure. But if you perturb it with wind, with children uh, jumping in, then you get a lot of structure. Ripples have a certain structure, a spatial temporal structure. And that structure is the name we give uh, to differences in the states of the thing. So the world has structure if it has different states and there is a dynamic interplay uh, between those states, across those states. Now, just like the surface of the lake can only have structure because it's extended in space and time, we have difficulty to think of how reality can have structure, can have dynamism, variety, stuff can happen in reality if it's outside space and time. Because without extension, all the states of reality seem to collapse on one another. They become one and the same state, which then by definition has no structure because it's only one state. Um, there is no difference between you and me if you and I occupied the same volume of space in the same moment of time. So the structure that arises from our differences would disappear if we occupied the same volume of space at the same moment of time. So th that is the Western difficulty of thinking of structure without extension which is what is demanded by analytic idealism in so far as it states that space and time are dimensions. There, I guess the world out there is not. Go ahead. But the, phenomena so the world out there, obviously. Uh, the noumena, if, if, yeah, I mean, the world out there, there's no time, right? It doesn't change. So difficult to, I mean, obviously you've just answered it there, but or at least gone some way to answering it. But yeah, that was basically the root of the of the question. No, I actually I, I was beginning my answer. I was just laying down the groundwork yeah, for my answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me let me try to give you the answer now. We have to avoid a certain logical fallacy, which is the following. We tend to think of something outside time as something that happens only now, in one point in time. No, that's time-based thinking. To say that something is outside time doesn't mean that it all happens at the same time. It means that it doesn't happen in time. To say that things are outside space doesn't mean that they all happen in the same point of space. No, it means that they are not in space. So you, we cannot think in terms of space and time. How are we to think then about structure without space-time extension? I propose the following. Uh, Imagine a database which has the records of every citizen in a village. Like I live in a village um, and the city hall does have just this record. They have a computer record uh, uh, for every single citizen in this village. Uh, and that record contains information like who I'm married to, who I'm living with, where do I work? Uh, uh, my, my, my health record is there, what illnesses I had, what I'm allergic to where I live, uh, 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 how much I'm paying taxes, all that information, it's in that database. Now, that database has a physical embodiment in space-time. It is on the hard disks of their server. And the information in those hard disks uh, is distributed in space and time. There are little electromagnetic islands on the surface of those electromagnetic disks that spin and so on and so forth. But notice that even if I would destroy every physical embodiment of the database, the relationships of meaning in the database would still exist. I would still be married to a certain person living in a certain address, even if there were no physical embodiment of any database keeping that information in space time. The meaning of the relationships in a database 
does not need space-time extension. Only the physical embodiment of that meaning does. And that's the important thing to keep in mind. Relationships of meaning are purely cognitive. They are outside space-time. They do not need extension. The meaning embodied in certain associations exists whether or not those associations are physically embodied in a hard disk drive. Meaning associations, meaning relationships are outside extension. They exist independently of extension. Uh, like my taste for the color orange, uh, is, it, it does not depend on space time. What is the length of my taste for the color orange? How, how heavy is my taste for the color orange? Can you take a ruler to it? Uh, you, you, you understand what I mean? Meaning relationships exist outside, outside extension. And that's how reality has structure outside extension. Reality, as the contents of a mind, are cognitive associations of meaning. They, they are meaning relationships. Out there, there are only meaning relationships. And those meaning relationships are incommensurable with space-time. They may gain space-time embodiment once they are represented on the dashboard. But in and of themselves, they exist outside and independently of space-time. That's how nature can have structure prior to extension. Now, now I've finished my answer. Yeah, okay. Cool. I think that, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, somebody's, yeah. Uh, and the chat wants to ask if uh, that implies that reality is static or not, if reality in of itself uh, changes or doesn't change. And I think change is just another word for time. So That's the point. We, 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 we always try to think of the timeless in terms of time <laughs> and of the spaceless in terms of space. Um, the very question, is reality static? What does that mean? It means the following. That reality is it the case that reality doesn't change in time? Well, you are presupposing time when you ask that question. Is reality static? Is the question, uh, is it the case that reality doesn't change in the course of time? You're presupposing time the moment you ask that question. So that's not the way to think about what's timeless. What's timeless isn't static and it isn't dynamic. Because static requires and presupposes time. Dynamism presupposes time. Change presupposes time. What is outside time is neither static nor dynamic. It's outside time. It's timeless. Now, if you try to visualize it, you immediately and um, unavoidably make, make a mistake because we visualize in extension. Because our dashboard uh, provides us with space-time, and that's all we have is our dashboard. We think in terms of the paradigm of the dashboard. We think in terms of the dimensions and, and, and properties of the dashboard. And we visualize in terms of the paradigm of the dashboard. So you cannot visualize timelessness and spacelessness. Don't even try, because if you try, you are unavoidably going to make a mistake. Just the kind of mistake you made when you asked the question, which is, does it mean that timeless reality is static? No, it means that it's timeless. <laughs> because being static is something that doesn't change in time. Um, we cannot use reason and speak coherently and accurately about the timeless and the spaceless. In other words, it's impossible to communicate that in the language of analytic philosophy. Um, the only way to grasp that is one, to have an experience of timelessness, which is possible. I guarantee you, I know it is possible. And the other way is to appeal to intuition. In other words, we now have to speak the language of poetry, of art, of film, of relationships. Um, of sex, um, it's not the language of concepts glued together according to the axioms and theorems of reason. That, 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 that tool doesn't, doesn't bring you there. 
uh, inherently. It's a very, very powerful tool given the, the scope within which it's applicable, but it's not applicable to timelessness and spacelessness. Um, trying to apply it there is like trying to use a hammer to tighten a screw. It's not going to end up well. Okay, so the person who asked that question wants to come on and ask a question themselves. Uh, just one moment. Uh, thank you for your response, by the way. Thank you very much for all the work you do as well. It's, uh, yeah, it's really been good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad with these people. Just so uh, everybody has such good questions. Um, I think Robin Nobody crazy. asked me what was the answer to the best criticism against <laughs> analytic idealism. I, I said what the best criticism were. I thought you guys would immediately say, okay, what's the answer then? <laughs> Nobody asked. Okay, uh, then well, I don't answer. The... <laughs> well, <laughs> now you mention it. I do like to know the answer. But Do you guys still remember what the best criticism was? No. It's the fact that our bodies are made up by cells that continue oh, right, to right, live right, even right, if yeah. they are harvested and grown in a Petri dish, which suggests that uh, no, we are pixelated because the representation is pixelated, so the subject must be pixelated. Well, I, I already gave you part of the answer just by characterizing the question that way. Um, the, the fact that the brain is made up of many neurons and that you can harvest those neurons and keep them growing on a Petri dish, what it shows is that the brain is pixelated. If you consider neurons right. the pixels, the brain is pixelated. I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, but what is the brain? The brain is an image on the dashboard. The brain is what appears on a little LCD screen on the dashboard of our airplane. It is not the thing in itself. The, th the thing in itself is the conscious inner life that appears on the dashboard as a brain with, it, with its patterns of activity. So the fact that the brain is made of neurons only tells you that the image on the dashboard is pixelated. Mm. Sure, sure, right, the, right, the right. dashboard is, is, is not perfect. If you look close enough, it will be pixelated, just like your computer screen right now. If you look very close, unless you have an Apple retina screen, if you look very close to my image on your screen, if you're watching it on YouTube after the fact, you will see that my face is constituted of lots of little rectangles. That doesn't mean that I am made of rectangles. It only means that my representation on your screen is pixelated. It's, uh, now, Donald Hoffman makes the exact same argument. Yeah, so yeah. The, the fact that the brain is made of neurons only means that the brain as a representation on the dashboard is a pixelated representation. It doesn't mean that the thing that is represented is itself pixelated, is itself made of fundamental little bricks or little rectangles. That is not entailed or implied. Pixelation is an artifact of the dashboard, of the representation, not of the thing in itself. Now, having said that, I want to give this criticism a little more credit because I think it's deeper than I'm making it sound right now. Um, and, and, and the depth has to do with where do you lay the boundary? Because you see, you can, I, you can cut your hair. I just cut my own hair a couple of hours ago. And uh, the only thing I felt um, was um, the trimming device touching my skin, but I didn't felt the blade. I didn't feel the actual cutting of my hair. I only felt the vibrations of the machine and the parts of the machine that were touching my skin, not the blades cutting my hair. I didn't feel my hair being cut. I heard it. I felt whatever touched my skin, but I didn't feel the actual cut. When I cut my nails, um, I feel movement on my finger and I feel something uh, on my other hand that's pressing the clipper, but the actual cut of the nail, I don't feel. I just don't feel it. So is the hair and the nail an integral part 
of the thing in itself, of my conscious in their life? Well, they don't seem to be. Now, where do you stop? Your epidermis is dead. You don't feel anything on the epidermis. What you feel is the pressure that is conveyed through the epidermis down to deeper layers of your skin. That's what you feel. So your epidermis is not part of you. Where do you stop? If you follow this line of reasoning, you will find that the point where you have to stop is your nervous system. Because only changes in the state of your nervous system are registered as conscious or as experiences. Whether they are under the light of metaconsciousness or not, doesn't matter. You only experience changes of states of your nervous system. And your nervous system is not only your brain. Uh, you, you, can Google, uh, you can Google it, a human nervous system dissected, dissected human nervous system, and you see what you are. And that has no fat cells, has no skin cells, has no bones, uh, um, has no muscles. Um, what we are is that octopus-like thing. It's like a brain, and then, and, and then like um, um, when, when you have... Um, not an octopus, but um, um, uh, what's the name in English? Tentacles. Jellyfish, jellyfish. Um, some jellyfish have these long, sophisticated tree-like tentacles with all kinds of, you know, little, little uh, branches branching out. Well, that's our nervous system. Our nervous system is like a jellyfish. It's a brain, like big ganglion at the top. And then all these little lines that sort of branch out from each other going through the entire body, that's what we are. Um, and that's what is empirically correlated with experience. Because, you know, you can undergo liposuction. You don't feel the suction of the fat. What you feel is whatever touches or in some way directly or indirectly changes the states of the nerve terminations around the place where you're undergoing liposuction. The fat cells themselves are just sort of blanketing you to, to, keep you, uh, uh, to keep your body temperature stable and to provide a reserve of energy. So I think we can follow the spirit of this question all the way down to your nervous system. And we can say your skin, your fat cells, your muscles, your skeleton, these are colonies of other stuff that... Uh, Evolution has favored. Evolution has favored that this colony of other cells would grow around what, what we actually are, which is represented by a nervous system, because it was good for the nervous system and it was good for these other cells as well, because the nervous system would make sure that the right actions would be taken to make sure that these cells are all well fed and, uh, and avoid harm and, and, and reproduce and all that stuff. So you can go as far as to say that what is a colony of individuals in our body is this meat, fat, and skin jacket plus the bone um, scaffolding that evolution has dressed us up with. Um, and and this, this stuff, these are colonies. It happened to have the same DNA, so that's where it becomes tricky because there is an argument to say that these are not colonies at all. They are integral parts of what we are because they have the same DNA. And when the DNA changes, they become cancer. And that what is it but a, a form of dissociation? Uh, cancer is the representation of a dissociation where dissociation shouldn't be happening. Um, and so there is an argument there. And I'm, I'm not decided which way to go. I'm still open. That's why I don't talk about it. Um, I'm, I have one foot on the hypothesis that uh, the real image of the altar is the nervous system alone. Everything else is a colony that evolution has favored to grow around what we really are, because it was good for everybody involved in that colony. Uh, and I have another foot on the hypothesis that no, it is the commonality of DNA that determines what is the image of the altar, not uh, uh, direct access to, to experience which only happens through the nervous system. You could say that uh, the fat cells do represent experiences that your ego is so dissociated from that you, that you never access them, you never experience them because they are dissociated from your ego. But they are, ex they are still experienced by your alter, which is more than your ego. So I have a foot on each side. That's why I don't 
talk about it often because I, unlike most philosophers, I don't like to talk about things I still didn't reach a minimum degree of co confidence in my own mind to talk about. That's not fashion in philosophy today. What's fashion in philosophy today is every two years, you publish a new book contradicting everything that you published two years before. And eventually you go full circle. And there are some very popular philosophers out there uh, who have gone full circle. You know, they publish enough books and then they go back to their first book. And <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your, your beta version. <laughs> and uh, I, I, right. I find this immature, yeah. childish. Um, so that's why I don't talk about this specific topic a lot. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to hark back to the previous question because there was someone who wants to want to follow up on that. EL66K. Are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear cool, me? Man. Go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, hello, Bernardo. Hi. Uh, this is a follow up to the time question. Um, I understand that space time is a emerging feature of our dashboard, right? Mm -hmm. However, one could argue that if we experience change and we are not apart from the one mind, we are it, right? And of course, we identify ourselves as an ego or as a body, as a personality. But the experience itself, it's an experience that MAL is having right now. My question will be is, wouldn't it be kind of like reifying some aspect of MAL or putting it in a more primary position that is maybe not deserved to say that, okay, MAL is outside of change or a is real it's outside of change because if we experience change if we have like an emotion right now and then another emotion if we experience certain meaning or certain perception and then it changes doesn't that imply that mind at large and consciousness yeah, itself I, is changing yeah I, I understand the spirit of your question um so bear with me i, I i'll try to to help you punch through the thing that is holding you back okay. to say uh, one that second my... I, I just need to interrupt el66k can you please uh, mute your mic in uh, uh, while bernardo is oh. answering thanks sure, sure, sure. okay to say that mao is outside change doesn't mean that it doesn't change because for something to not change it has to be amenable to change to say that Mao is outside change does not mean that it doesn't change. It means only that it's outside change. In other words, the word change, whether applied positively or negatively, does not uh, apply to Mao. It's not the right way of thinking about mind at large as it is in and of itself. Um, so how are we to interpret our experience of change? Here's the way to go. There is something about mind at large that when represented on the dashboard leads to that thing we call change. In other words, what we call change corresponds to something true about Mal. It is a projection of something about Mal that we cannot even talk about because it is incommensurable with our language, with our logic, with our way of thinking about reality. That something incommensurable, ineffable, transcendent, epistemically transcendent, that's something, whatever it is, don't try to think about what it is, or don't try to visualize it. Just accept, it, it, for the sake of argument, that there is such a thing, whatever it is. We, we, we can't describe it. We can't talk about it. We can only acknowledge that it exists. There is something about Mao that, when measured and represented on the dashboard, leads to what we call change. But change as a concept is only applicable to the dashboard representation. 
not to the thing that is represented. So when we say that Mao is outside change, we are not saying that it doesn't change. I, I keep on repeating this because repetition helps. Because even if you accept the first time I said it, your mind will find a way to wiggle back to where you were before. And, and, you, and then again, you get caught in that trap. To say that Mao is outside change does not mean that it doesn't change. Because to say that it doesn't change presupposes that the concept of, concept of change is applicable to it. Only then can we deny that it changes because the concept is at all applicable to it, but it's not. What I'm saying is that the concept is not applicable to it. So it makes no sense to say that it does change or, or that it doesn't change. It's like saying, is the number five married or not? You know, good luck. You know, you, whatever way you argue this, no, no, the number five is married. No, it cannot be married. Oh, therefore, the number five is not married. No, neither is correct. The concept of marriage does not apply to the number five. In exactly the same way, the concept of change does not apply to mind at large. So it doesn't make sense to say that it, it changes or that it doesn't change for the same reason that it doesn't make sense to say that the number, si number five is married or the number five isn't married. No, it's not applicable. All we can say is that there is something unspeakable, uh, unvisualizable about mind at large that when represented on the dashboard becomes what we call change. In other words, what we call change does represent something real. It is valid input about what's going on. It's valid input about the nature of nature but it is a representation thereof. It's a projection. It's a, a hint uh, uh, um, in the same way that the needle on the dial on a dashboard represents air pressure variation. But air pressure variation looks nothing like the movement of a needle inside the dial, even though the needle does represent air pressure variation. Not only that, it represents air pressure variation accurately. So accurately, that the pilot can fly a plane by instruments alone. So I'm not even den denying the accurateness of the representation. I'm only saying that the properties and the way of thinking applicable to the dial are not applicable to the thing represented by the dial. I cannot say that air pressure went up the scale or down the scale of the dial. Air pressure has nothing to do with the dial. The dial is a representation of air pressure that in a sense is incommensurable with air pressure. So the words and concepts we apply to the dial are not applicable to the air pressure variations outside the airplane. In the same way, the word and concept of change does not apply to whatever change represents about mind at large. But that representation is accurate. It does represent something real about mind at large. Yet the representation is incommensurable with that thing real for the same reason that the movements of the needle in the dial is incommensurable with the actual air pressure variations outside the airplane. I don't know whether it helped. Hopefully it did. Thank you. I, uh, first, Can I? Uh, yep. One second. Uh, Bernardo, how are you on time? We are about two and a half hours in. Shall we do another you? half hour and then it's 11 o'clock? Sure, I will, fine. I'll call it the day for me. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. Yeah. Um, I think Roland wanted to, Roland had a comment. Yeah, when I talk to people who've had mystical experiences of timeless states, they say it's ineffable, but if they had to put it in the language of the dashboard, it would be something that is unchanging. But automatically it doesn't apply because it's just the language of the dash dashboard pointing something transcendent. That is the... The, the, the crux of religion. It's the attempt to talk about something that cannot be talked about and yet is real. <laughs> um, and that is the difficulty. Um, I think I have experienced timelessness once, <laughs> which is a contradiction in terms. How could I have experienced timelessness once? If it's outside time, it's not once. 
<laughs> it was not then, it's not now, it will not be in the future, it's outside time. Um, and if I would try to speak about it, I would speak about it as one of those old vinyl records, long plays, with music in them, in the grooves. The music is all there. Um, but if you move the needle to different places of, of the record, you hear different parts of the music. But the music is all there. It's, it, it's all one unit. Uh, you, you could say it's all happening at once, but that's incorrect because it's outside time. It's not happening at once. It just exists as a whole outside time. Uh, but the moment I say this, I immediately realize that it's completely inappropriate what I just said. It's a completely inappropriate description of the experience. Um, and yet it's the best I can do. And that's, that's how religion goes wrong. Uh, the founders of religion usually have had valid real experiences and then they tried to talk about it <laughs> and back in the day it was easier than today because back in the day say when the exiled jews in babylon wrote the the old testament nobody would expect you to write something meaning it literally this idea of literal truth didn't exist everything was by analogy Thinking was analogical. Communication was analogical. Nobody would ever interpret that stuff literally because the concept of literal interpretation didn't happen. Uh, mind thinks analogically. Uh, literal interpretation was something created probably in the West, in the late Middle Ages. Um, and uh, so for them back in the day, the problem was less severe because nobody would make this mistake of does he mean literally that the man physically rose from the dead three days afterwards uh, uh and nobody would have this thought what people would think is think is what is it about a man rising from the dead three three days afterwards what is it about that story that is the same as about reality people would look for the analogy nobody would would think that Oh, the Jews meant, well, that's the New Testament, but um, okay, they were still Jews. The Jews meant that the man literally, you know, this will not happen. But it happens today. So the job of religion now has become a lot more difficult. And you need to have what people call apologetics, as if religion needed an apology. This is absolutely preposterous. Absolutely preposterous. But anyway, I don't, I don't want to go down this rant because we have limited time. <laughs> Uh, EL66K, you, you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, 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 yeah. thank you. Um, so I think I, I can help but feel that there is some kind of arbitrary distinction here between the dashboard and the thing in itself. When I know there's the Kantian argument, right? There's the noumena and we observe only a phenomena. Isn't it arguable that the phenomena is actually a part of the noumena? The dashboard is mal if we see the dashboard change that in itself is mal changing sure there is a lot of it that we cannot access and that we cannot describe and that we cannot talk about however what we can metacognize is not apart from the thing in itself is the thing in itself we can access it through our intellect and we observe it change just in that limited sense you can uh, well, say that I, I, answered your, I answered your question. Clearly, my answer didn't go through uh, to you. This can happen. Uh, you're not going to change the habits of thought of a lifetime uh, in a two-minute answer. Uh, at the same time, I, I have limited time, so I, I, I can't go through it again. When the video is published, you can go back to the answer I gave you, and you can try to listen to it again and see if it helps. I, right now, I can't do better than, than I already tried, and that's my own limitation. Okay, no problem. We'll just uh, I'll just go to another question. Um, question I found again on uh, Meta Um It's from again Federica. Uh, it's it, it's another long one, but um, I've tried to condense it. Um, he or she asks. Uh, but another starting point is um, notice that the boundaries of our bodies of our body are not arbitrary. Our ability to perceive ends at the surface of, our, of, our, of the body, our skin, retinas, eardrums, etc. This statement implicitly excludes all sorts of so-called para, para 
psychological evidence such as out-of-body experiences, NDEs, and so on. Moreover, Bernardo writes, clearly, thus, the delineation of our body is not a question of epistemic convenience, it is an empirical fact, in contrast with the concept of an inanimate car, for example, where the car is actually an abstraction. Well, could not one argue that the body is also a concept founded on epistemic convenience? After all, the body, like the car, also needs air and fuel to function. And skin falls off continuously, which moves the boundary of perception. And a similar critique could be made about thought when one accepts para parapsychological evidence. Okay. The basis for saying that the car is a nominal subset of nature, in other words, it, it's just a part of nature that we arbitrarily delineate in order to be able to buy that part of nature. We have to call it something. So it's a nominal delineation. The argument for why it's nominal is based on function. You could say, well, the spark plugs are integral to the car because if I remove it, the car doesn't move. Well, by the same token, if you remove the road, the car doesn't move. If you remove uh, uh, the air that the engine needs for combustion, the car doesn't move. If you remove the gravity of the planet, the car doesn't move because the tires will not grip the road. So on a functional basis, uh, uh, the delineation or the carving out of the physical world into separate objects is nominal. It's arbitrary. It's purely epistemic. It doesn't have an ontological, an ontic grounding um, because for anything to function, you end up needing the whole of the universe. Because even the very existence of gravity requires the quantum fields which span the length of the universe. They're not localized. So to, to carve out the inanimate world into separate inanimate objects on a functional basis leads to a nominal carving out, an arbitrary carving out. Now, to carve out living beings as actual proper parts of the universe, that is ontic but it's not done on a functional basis. And that's the conflation that is in the question. She is lifting the basis of my argument for saying that physical objects are just nominal, which was function. She's bringing it to the argument about the bodies being actual uh, uh, subsets of the universe. But my argument for that had nothing to do with functionality. Uh, and, and that's the error. Uh, in the premise of the question. She is, she is assuming, or she misunderstood it, or she's misportraying uh, that wrong link. The basis for considering our bodies proper parts of the universe is not function, it's experience. If you prick my chair with a needle, I will not feel it. But if you prick my arm, I will. If something impinges on my nervous system, I feel it. If a photon hits the wall next to me, I don't see it. But if it hits my retina, I experience it. On the basis of what we do experience and what we don't experience, we can, on an ontic, non-arbitrary, non-nominal basis, delineate the boundaries of the body. Or at the very least, and that goes back to my previous answer, the boundaries of the nervous system. Because whatever doesn't impinge on the nervous system, changing its states, I do not experience. I do not experience the photons hitting the heads uh, of Australians right now on the other side of the planet. So on this basis, what impingements I do feel and what impingements I don't feel, forget function. I'm talking about experience, not function. So on the basis of what I do feel and what I don't feel, where do you prick me that I feel and what do you prick and I don't feel? Where do the photons impinge and I see them and where do they hit and I don't? experience them, on that basis, you can delineate the boundaries of us, our dissociative boundaries. And that's not merely convenience. That's not arbitrary. That has an ontic aspect. It's determined by what we experience and what we don't. And it's a different argument than the argument that physical objects are purely nominal. That argument was on the basis of function. The argument about bodies was not function, it was done on the basis of experience. Thank you. I think questions about the same thing in different wordings helps you get deeper to, because mostly these questions are, can be 
construed as misunderstandings. And I think answering these misunderstandings will help people, or at least me, to better understand better understand your theory. So thank you for that. Um, I think I do have another. I'll 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 give you an easy one. Um, it's from Dreams of Electric Sheep. He asks, what is your response to physicalist views that appeal to the grounding relation in order to explain the problems associated with physicalism? <laughs> there we go. That's uh, one of those hairy things in analytic philosophy. What is grounding? Many papers have been published about what well, grounding means. If you can explain this, because I'm not, I'm, I know a little bit, but I could, I could use some elucidation. There are many different proposals about what grounding uh, means. The general idea is when one phenomenon is grounding is grounded on another, then there is a sense in which everything about the grounded phenomenon can be accounted for on the basis of the thing it's grounded on. Um, so to say that the mind is grounded on the brain means that there is nothing about the mind that uh, that you can't account for in terms of brain structure and dynamics right uh, so notice that it's a little more general than a, a relationship of causality grounding is a little bit more general than causality um, you can say that one thing is grounded on, an, on you can say that a is grounded on b without b directly causing a now that's what it's that's how it's attempted. Uh, whether this really holds water, whether you really can have grounding in, in any sense be more general than causality is, is open to question. It, th there is a lot of debate around this. Um, I think the appeal to grounding under physicalism is just a silly attempt to circumvent the failure of physicalism to account causally for the mind in terms of the brain. So they just go hand waving and they say, well, we don't know how the brain may cause the mind, but woo, 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 the mind is grounded in the brain because we can account for. Now, what do you mean by account for if it's not, ca if, if it's not causation being entailed? You know, when I, I and Professor Kelly wrote a Scientific American article criticizing the psychedelic researchers on that research about uh, brain noise, um, we criticized them for the preposterousness of saying that uh, you, you could explain uh, the psychedelic experience uh, based on that minuscule increase in brain noise. And uh, then they published an answer. In the answer, they say, we're not trying to explain the mind in terms of brain noise. We are trying to account for the psychedelic experience based on brain noise. And you go like, what does that even mean? <laughs> And it's one of those slimy ways to avoid the criticism. Because you say, well, I'm not talking about causation, I'm talking about grounding. But, but then if you try to ask them, well, what is this accounting for if it's not causation? You would draw a blank. It's just hand-waving. It's a linguistic way to evade a, a direct refutation. Uh, it's pure evasion. And I... Uh, I think there are situations, situations in analytic philosophy, and now I don't want to get into all the, the details and nuances, but there are situations in which it makes at least epistemic sense to talk about grounding uh, in situations where you don't know enough to talk about causality, but you know that certain correlations are empirical facts. You can talk about grounding, which is a way to sort of remain agnostic. Notice that it's valid precisely when you are not trying to provide an explanation. Uh, you're trying to remain agnostic of it. You can say, well, it's correlation, so I'll talk about grounding. I don't have a causal chain yet, so I'll remain neutral and I'll talk about grounding. But to save physicalism, you don't want to remain neutral. You want to save physicalism. <laughs> and then it's not enough to talk about grounding. It becomes dismissive, it becomes evasive, uh, uh, because you are defending an explicit point of view you took. You're not remaining neutral, you're not saying, I don't know whether physicalism is not true, but there is a grounding relationship between the mind and the brain because they are correlated. Well, fine, I could equally say the other way around. 
I could say there is a grounded relationship between the brain and the mind. The brain is grounded on the mind because there is a correlation between the two. So I accept that point on an agnostic context, uh, but only in the same sense that, that, that I accept the opposite point. The grounding relationship can be accounted in both ways, can be claimed in both ways. Um, but when somebody is taking a point of view, saying, I am a physicalist, and then tries to defend it through grounding, that's just evasive. It, 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 I find it amazing that this stuff is taken seriously in academic philosophy. This, just like I find it amazing that the anthropic brain hypothesis is even published because it's an absolutely preposterous idea. And if you say, well, it's not preposterous because we are not trying to explain the psychedelic experience, we are just trying to account for it. And then, then, then you're not saying anything. Then if you exclude the explanatory hypothesis for the uh, uh, anthropic brain hypothesis, if you exclude that, then you're excluding everything that could be of any remote interest in that hypothesis. It's a situation where without that, the hypothesis means absolutely nothing and it's completely irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. You take that paper and you clean yourself with it. <laughs> it has no value beyond that. So the game that is played is to avoid the direct refutation, they claim neutral ground. You're not explaining, we're we are counting, or it's just a grounding relationship. But to attract relevance, the only way they can attract relevance is to implicitly appeal for that causal relationship. Otherwise, why would anybody write that paper or publish that paper? I mean, it, it means nothing. So that's the game that is played. You, you attract funding and you attract media attention by almost explicitly, but still, still implicitly, suggesting that you're providing an explanation. And then when people come to you and say, that's nonsense, and you refute that explanation, then they say, well, 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 we're not claiming an explanation here. It's just an account or some grounding relationship. But if that's the case, then there is no reason to have any interest in that paper at all. And that's the slimy game that is uh, engaged in today. You see it uh, in many parts in science and philosophy today. It's a very, very slimy game, uh, which is understandable because, you know, these people, all they have is their careers and their name. That's their lives. You know, it's when you are in the position I was in, I was working in the high tech world. I didn't depend on this stuff financially at all. Uh, I could be very neutral. I could be completely impartial about how I regarded the evidence and how I went about reasoning this stuff. But for these people, you know, it, it's a big life thing. So the whole game is biased, is prejudiced by construction because we've turned science as opposed to something financed by uh, patrons, like art still was for a long time. Um, we turned it into a job that needs a nearly performance review. And that's when things can start going very wrong. Thank you. Uh, someone on the surface says, got a lot of Bernardo's passion and commitment to refuting other views. So <laughs> there you go. Um, the last question I'm going to ask is, uh, I've been asking or giving you criticism so far. Uh, I think I'm going to ask my last question, not as a criticism, but maybe more practical advice, um, or at least a request for practical advice. Uh, it's from, asks, uh, considering most people are just quote unquote, regular people, uh, like doing regular jobs, having an average IQ, living their life with the average mix of challenges, pleasures, and suffering. What do you think the long-term or passive effect could be for those individuals if they would accept the truth slash rationale of analytic idealism when they themselves would not actively be seeking utility in the theory? Would they notice a gradual change in themselves or would others? What kind of changes could one expect? And do you know of people who have observed this in themselves and what do you think, realistically, the effect of analytic ide idealism would be if it were broadly taught in schools, let's say for one or two generations, just like we now teach kids basic math these days? To change everything, everything. You would look at life through different colored lenses, which means that everything, everything would change. How you regard others, how you regard the meaning and purpose of your life, 
how you regard the world, what the world means, uh, everything, how you regard health, how you go about maintaining your health. Uh, the implications are vast. And there is one thing that was subtly suggested in the question that, that I want to counter, uh, which is the notion that you need a high IQ to buy into analytic idealism. Uh, analytic idealism is one of the most self-evident narratives about what's going on that there can possibly be. It's just that we are so contaminated by a very abstract, alternative, incomplete, explanatorily insufficient narrative that the most obvious things become complex because we don't take the short way to the obvious. Materialism took us to the other side, and now we have to go a long loop around, starting from materialism, to go back to idealism. But if there were no materialism, idealism is the most self-evident thing there is. All we have is experience, therefore, all is experience. But what about what appears on the screen of perception? Well, look at yourself in the mirror when you are crying. Your tears are material, and they are the image on the mirror of your inner sadness. There you go. Matter is what inner experience looks like when observed from the outside. And if matter is that in your body, then the matter in the rest of the world is the same. Then there is another side to the world. It is experiential. And just like in your case, the matter of the world is a representation of an experience. Because all we have is experience, so there is only experience. But experience can be experienced in two different ways. One, a direct way, your inner sadness in an indirect way mediated by, the, mediated by the screen of perception, in which inner sadness becomes matter through that intermediation. And right. matter, of course, only exists as a perceptual experience. So matter itself is also experiential. It's so overwhelmingly obvious, natural. It accounts for life. It explains so naturally why life truly is different than a robot. Because life is what a dissociative uh, 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 complex in the mind of nature looks like. And a robot is not. A robot is a mechanism. It's an arbitrarily carved out subset of the inanimate universe that only exists as a whole. Everything falls together. Uh, all the paradoxes of science disappear. Uh, in quantum physics, you know, all those entanglements and all of those legates and, and bells and equalities experiments that show us that matter doesn't exist until you make an observation. Well, is that mind boggling? Of course not. If matter is a representation of the world and the world itself is not material, then of course matter only exists when you make a measurement. The dashboard only shows something when the airplane sensors make a measurement of the world outside. And the world outside is not the dashboard. The same right, for right. the same. You see, there is so, no difficulty in this. Okay, so you say it would change everything. Um, have you observed this in, in other people? Have you Do you know people that were like not didn't know about your theory or uh, uh, were uninformed or at least were transformed by it afterwards when they understood it? Did you, did you see that in people? Did you get any feedback? Yes, but I don't want to talk about uh, other people's inner life. So I would talk only about things that are either published or that refer to my own inner life. Um, it, it, it's a tricky ethical territory to start talking about how my friend by that name, how his life has changed because analytic idealism. Look, for me, well, you don't have to name the person, but it's like a doctor. Like I have a patient who has this and this, and you know, it's like maybe it's, it, if you don't <laughs> okay. want to, don't. Even it's, it's fine. It's tricky. I, I prefer okay, to then... talk about myself because I have direct access to it, so Fair I can enough. speak in details and with authority. Um, how I regard health has changed. I understand now that physical health is at bottom psychological health, the psychological health of parts of my mind that are not my ego, part of my mind that I'm dissociated from, and therefore don't even recognize as my own. And because of that, I may neglect those parts of my mind. I may treat them badly. I may repress them. I may even deny their rights to exist. And therefore, their lack of psychological health becomes somatized because their health, the appearance of their health is what I call my physical body. So my physical health at bottom is my psychological health, not the health of my ego alone, but of the whole of my altar. And that completely changes your attitude to medicine, to self-care, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the health of others, uh, to your ideas about what avenues medicine should explore in order to solve stress, depression, 
but also heart disease and cancer. Um, another thing it changed is my relationship with the meaning of life. For me, the world now is a book to be read. It's a representation. In other words, the whole world is a symbol, almost a religious symbol in the sense that it points at something beyond itself, something transcendent. In the same way that the dial on the dashboard points at the storm outside the airplane, but you can't see the storm because your airplane has no windows. All you have is the dial. If you think the dial is all that exists, you live in a very claustrophobic world, that little airplane cabin. If you think the dial is the thing itself, the dial is the ultimate meaning, you will be living a very claustrophobic life. But if you understand that the dials are representations of a transcendent world outside, not another world, it's the same world, but outside the room of the dashboard, your world becomes so spacious. Everything now has meaning. Not the meaning of a schizophrenic that sees conspiracy theories everywhere. No, a more mature sense of meaning in which you realize that nature itself is like, it's the body of God. In the same way that my body is a representation of my conscious inner life, so is the physical universe a representation of the universal mind. And brings back into life a level of depth, of mystery, and of meaning that is impossible to have under a physicalist narrative. Uh, certain things go away, like uh, nihilistic depression, existentialist depression, falls by the wayside. It's totally nonsensical. It, 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 it doesn't fit anywhere. Other bad things return, like death anxiety returns. Death is now an unfathomable change in your state of mind over which you will, have, you will have no control. You will have to undergo it. And you, know how it, you don't know how it's going to feel. And you have every reason to be anxious about it, like I am. And I was not when I was a materialist. But when you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> you know, it's over. And there's nothing to fear. Now there is. Um, I could go on and on. <laughs> Everything no, no, changes. Great. Thank you. Well, if you cannot talk about other people, I think... Uh, uh, well, let, let me suggest you one book. I will suggest you a book by a man called Federico Fagin, who is the inventor of both the microprocessor and Silicon Gates technology. We owe it to him the last 50 years of computer innovation, the internet, the whole thing. You can trace it back to him in 1971. Um, read his book called Silicon, which is half philosophy and half biography. He is an idealist. He is probably the world's, the, the world's most well-rounded idealist alive. He's a physicist by education, winner of the Medal of Honor in the U.S. I mean, it, it, you couldn't get anybody more respectable. Okay. Read his book and you will see how his life changed. I'll check it out. Talk, Thank you. He, talk, he talks about his four lives. His life changed so much that he talks about it as a new life. I think Raman wants to... Uh briefly tell you how it's impacted his on how did how does it impacted him on a personal basis uh it's mostly negatively impacted me because uh, as you <laughs> said the, your, your sense of empathy increases a lot and yes yeah the, the idea that i'm everyone it's such a it's such a horrible thought it's not good for my mental health to be honest um i if i can share something with you um for me, um, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, um, I think it was 10 times more difficult than it would otherwise have been if I didn't have the understanding I have today. And um, I had a lot of trouble um, trying to find a way to live with that reality in the first weeks. Um, I, I'll, I'll say something that will look horrible in your first knee-jerk reflex will be to reject it outright. If so, then so be it. At least I will have planted a seed and maybe at some point you will have a little bit more understanding towards yourself, a little bit more patience and uh, more acceptance uh, towards yourself. And the horrible thought is the following. You have to forgive yourself for being a jerk. You have to forgive yourself if one day you wake up and you say, today I will insulate myself from the suffering of others. Um, 
when that thought comes, your first instinct is, it is this jerk-like stuff. I cannot live like this. I cannot insulate myself deliberately from the suffering of others. Um, but you have to, because if you don't, you will tax your system so much that one, you will stop living your life, and two, you'll not be able, be able to help anyone. Nobody gains from the dysfunction of unchecked empathy. Not only you, nobody else has anything to gain about it. Um, what you have to do is to create a room in the mansion of your mind where empathy is. And it's a room that's very easily accessible. And you have to go there every now and then to keep your humanity. Um, but you cannot live in that room. You have to go to your living room, to your dining room, to your games room, where you are insulated from that. Um, and you have to keep the memory of what you know when you are in that room to inform your decisions. Like, where are you going to use your money at the current historical junction that we are living through in Europe? Are you going to buy a new pair of shoes or are you going to put your money to the service of people who need? That's only one example. Um, how are you going to calibrate your political decisions based on what you know when you are in that empathy room? Are you going to say, uh, let's help Ukraine as long as I, I don't have to, uh, to have economic hardship? Uh, as long as I can keep taking a hot shower every day, uh, I'm willing to help Ukraine. But if I can't take a hot shower every day because there isn't gas enough or it's too expensive, then I don't want to help Ukraine anymore. Is that what you want to do? Well, I guarantee you, if you go every now and then to the empathy room, that's not what you're going to do. You're going to live your life differently. So you need to be able to access the empathy room regularly in order to preserve your humanity. But you cannot inhabit that room at all times because you will be dysfunctional. dysfunctional. Uh, and you would just not help anyone, not yourself, not God, not your fellow human beings. No one, no one has to gain from that. You have to learn how to be a jerk. Thank you, Bernardo. That means a lot more than you know. Thank you. And with that being said, um, I think we're out of time. It's 11 o'clock. Um, Thanks, everybody. I enjoyed this event a lot. It's uh, one of the best events uh, I engage in. Um, I expected oh, more you. firepower, so maybe next time you can take more time in the prep work <laughs> uh, and, and bring in uh, more firepower, because I'll be very honest with you. Yeah, um, please do. This, this stuff that comes out of my mouth, it is primed by criticism. Um, I, I cannot do it spontaneously. It, it, it doesn't come through spontaneously. Um, so I use criticism as a, a form of help secretly. I don't let people, I don't let my best critics know that they are actually helping me and, and that I very much depend on them. Um, not, all, not all of them. Some critics, critics are just silly. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's the thing. Yeah. If, if you try to find good criticism, there's a lot of silliness out there, and I don't want to waste your time with that. And Yeah, yeah don't, don't do that. It's not an invitation to bring all the silliness. It's so, it will be a waste of time. And then but you have the, the questions ones that, that I don't understand. So it feels false to ask the questions I don't understand. It's like, because if you'd ask, like, uh, what do you mean? I would like to say, I, I don't know. That sounds silly, too. Maybe we can bring more people to the live chat so they can ask the questions uh, themselves. But they, there is always more passion and more nuance uh, when the question is asked by the person who formulated yes, it. Yes, I agree. I, t I totally agree. I would love, if, I would love it if more people would be here to ask questions, but that's not something I have on a, on a direct control. So that's, I, I try to have enough questions and at least, uh, well, this round, at least uh, some criticism. I focused on the criticism. I'm trying to, if you do another round, I will try to find more criticism, but I cannot promise this. This, this, is, this, is, this is not as easy as I, okay. as I thought okay. it would be. We can take another turn next time. If we want to do it the, uh, uh, the next time, I'm willing to do it the next time if you guys want. You're um, so gracious. We can do something differently. We can talk about, I don't know, the implications of analytic idealism or how you live life informed by analytic idealism. I don't know, other things. Um, 
well, whatever you guys want to do. Um, Fine. I'm open. I'm open thank for you. it. Okay. So for anyone listening, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the questions. Um, and I wish you all a good night. And until next time. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks.